Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast, is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Constellation Last Day Media's conversational podcast. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother, Dagan Moriarty. Dagan, wearing that Last Stand merch. Look at you, my friend. How are you today? Represent. Howdy. Howdy, you guys. What's going on? I'm still looking. I'm trying to see. Am I looking a little ruddy, a little rosy still? Is this outside dealing with the snow? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It snowed yeah. about six inches. You know what, though? Me and Maddie were just saying this. It hasn't, and you were saying this too, Kyle, down down in Richmond. When you haven't got like a significant snow in a while. Mm-hmm. I think I heard a statistic in Philly that it had been like a record eight hundred days or something without more than an inch or two. So this wow. feels like the Philly I knew from growing up: rocky, gray skies, snowing, foot of snow on the buildings, running down Ben Franklin Parkway to the Rocky Stairs. Like this feels like the way it should be here mm. it's a little bit of a nuisance but you gotta kind of gotta kind of just roll with it right and i have this thing like i'm getting older but <laughs> maddie was just saying his snowblower broke i have yeah, this bro. thing that snowblowers are for pusses right <laughs> oh i don't okay. know, I don't know how you really feel <laughs> i have one i have it but i won't use it my policy is foot of snow i'll bring the snowblower out right but yeah, so it's like a point of pride that I'm 50, but I could, I'm still out there shoveling. I have a pretty big driveway. It's pretty big. Yeah. Right? But there's going to come a day where five inches of snow is going to warrant the snowblower, but it is not this day. It's probably the next time it snows. <laughs> Didn't someone ca- like famous get catastrophically injured by a snowblower recently? Oh, no. Right? A snow plow. That was oh, Jeremy snow Rain- pl- Rain- oh, snow Rain- Renner. Right? Oh, was- yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's uh, David Jaffe. Um, storied game designer <laughs> I don't, so the, the episode of uh, sacred symbols plus hasn't gone out yet but we immediately went with that episode was completely off the rails people are going to love it but uh, it's like, we, it's like I, a shared universe you have to watch all the all the last stand to figure out what the fuck you're talking about yeah exactly there's so much lore yeah um in, in all of our shows but uh i always introduce you or write you up as legendary games designer which you took umbrage with and so we decided that storied would be more accurate mm-hmm. um and so welcome to the show my friend good to see you it's really good to to be here. I didn't know Maddie Plays was coming on. I saw his email, and I don't. I didn't know his real name. I just thought his name was Mister, and his middle name was Maddie, and his last name was Plays. And I'm like, right. oh, that's that guy. It's um, me. Um, I didn't know you had a real name. I, yeah. I knew you did, I but I didn't know you. You know, my parents. Used unfortunately, it. their last name is not Plays. It is not. It would plays. be sick. Though. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's nice cool. to be here. I appreciate you guys having me back. Uh, I will uh, try my best to keep up. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Yeah, we just did a funny episode of Sacred Symbols Plus, which have already gone live by the time you heard this. So go check that out. We talk about all sorts of things. And finally, Mr. Maddie plays. It's so interesting, Maddie. You have a handle, and I never really had a handle growing up. Like a like a, I was C Moriarty on Game Facts, right? Mm-hmm. And then I was Colin Moriarty at IGN and go all these kinds of things. I was for a little while. I used I, my first aim name was as I've said before, Drax Curse. When there was a ten. 10 uh, nice. character limit for Castlevania 3, but what is it like having a... Well, welcome to the show, first of all. What is it like <laughs> having a, a a handle? Because it's so interesting. I, I could have created something for myself, and I never really did. You know. Uh, well, first, it's good to be here. Um, it's going to get interesting in a couple of years as I like do more and more, because I think Mr. Maddie is like the first, I guess, big thing I did, if you will. But as I expand more, it's like some people... Like I've seen comments of people who don't know me as Mr. Maddie like come into... <clears throat> defining duke they're like oh man retro rebounds here or why and i'm like <laughs> so um it's interesting because now people are calling me multiple things and like you know no one's i, I don't think if like when my game comes out people are going to call me like mr maddie plays like you know they're probably calling by my name maddie schroeder so uh i don't know like i guess it's funny because like my first actual online name was glitcher 27 <laughs> and i remember having a talk with a i don't even remember this fucking dude's name anymore but i remember like when we were trying to name my next YouTube channel, he was like, you got to do something attached to you because your old name, when you wanted to evolve, like you grew out of that quick. Right. And like, it, it didn't fit what you wanted to do next. I was like, yeah. So if it's me, it's my name, then 
yeah, I could do anything I want. Right. And so, I mean, it worked out, I guess, long term, but I, I guess I don't feel anything about it. I don't think much about it. Um, you know, but people call me as a joke all the time in my, my personal life. Yeah. So it's something it's cool, I guess. Well, it's good to see you. I like the, uh, the orange. It's like a bright orange sweatshirt that you're wearing. Yes. I love the color orange. Thank you. It's very pleasant. I have green color. under here. I'm wearing actually my own last stand merch. Oh, Steve. cool. The Finding Duke shirt on. Nice. Very I, nice. I have a, I have a bumper one. sticker, Moriarty and uh, 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 Ray Gun. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. I don't I have any for, merch, I don't think, in my I'd background. I vote for you guys. Th- thank you. I, we would be in, in, well, actually, no, yeah, we would be ineligible constitutionally still because of Chris, technically, but mm. um, but oh, soon I great. think we will be able to, who knows where we're going to vote? Who knows if we're even going to vote? <laughs> the world might be <laughs> yeah, over by the time right, we get, yeah, we get to true. November. Um. Maddie, I was uh, fascinated by your topic. I think actually all the topics this week are really good, but um, I wanted to begin with you this week to sure. get in, into your head here because uh, your topic, I've never I've never personally really been into it, but our nephew, Diggins, and my oldest nephew, who's a senior in high school, is really into it as well. Mm-hmm. And then I watch some of these YouTube channels that do some of this stuff as well. So I'm, I'm interested sure. to hear your tales. Yeah, my topic is thrifting, going to thrift stores, getting a good pickup. Um, at first I, so my fiance introduced me to this. Um, and at first I was kind of like, you know, what's the point? Right. Um, but then we went on like a, a thrift store tour is what I call it. Like, let's just go to local thrift shops and see what we find. Um, we did this because we were hosting a Christmas Eve party. It was like 30 people and we had just moved in here within the last, you know, half a year. And so, it was like, all right, we got to put pedal to the metal and get this house looking Christmassy quick, but we're on a budget. So we got to figure that out, too. Um, and so we were like, let's go to the thrift store and let's see what we got here. And we need everything from like a Christmas tree holder to decorations to lights to artificial Christmas trees and, uh, you know, even um, like runners, like everything. And we scored 100 percent. And like we managed to decorate the entire house for Christmas under 100 bucks which is crazy to think about, you know, a lot of these knickknacks that we found like little, I love the ceramic Christmas village sets for those who know what I'm talking about. Like I just, they light up together and at night, I think it's just very, something very peaceful about it. I love it. Um, and so like these thrift stores were just stocked with them. People give away, you would be shocked what people give away. Um, and you'll find stuff that's borderline brand new that people are like, I have no use for this. And they just throw it to like uh, goodwill or savers or something like that. And just boom, it's like it's right there. Um, and so at first I was kind of like eh, about it, but going in there and being able to decorate our whole house and like then you you go through the familial test. Like what are, what's the vibe? Like how are people liking what we did here? And like compliments on the decorations, the vibe of the house, the setup. And I was like, OK, like, wow, they you know, the, the, I think the reason people stay away from thrifting is like they could they tell it's junk. Do they think it's junk? Does it look like junk? And it's really not. It's just like one person's trash is another person's treasure, right? Uh, and so I, I just found myself so bewildered at not only how much money we saved, because before that, we went to a uh, a Christmas decoration store. And, you know, for like $200, we got like six things. But then we got the rest of the house for under 100 It was like, wow, what a difference uh, when you choose to buy used. And I mean, I, I would say this is kind of dovetailing into buying used rather than just thrifting, because like, I buy all my games on eBay. Like I buy everything where I can secondhand. And, even new, you know, even new games. Um, not new games because they'll just buy them from like Walmart and then resell them. Yeah, and at that right. point, it's like you know, what am I doing? Right, like right, right. So, you, but you use that for like your your older titles. Yeah, for sure, older stuff. Yeah, you know, because I, I mean, there's like sustainable reasons behind it, right? Like I don't want to sound preachy to the audience, so it's like I don't really need to get into to all of that. But like we do things here, like we just tried eco bricking, like where you like take your your rubbish your garbage and chop it up into bits and stuff it into bottles and it saves you a lot of garbage space so you're throwing less out we have a loamy here so we take like leftover food scraps it, it's turned into soil uh this is all my fiance by the way i cannot take credit for any of this she's <laughs> definitely led the charge on all of this stuff and uh and made it feel like natural and not super forced and not a more importantly a pain in the ass but um, yeah, this like way of life is is really interesting because like I've got decorations in here from like curtains and blinds to shelving units from thrift stores, and uh, it's saved me an incredible amount of money. And it's you never know what you're gonna find in there. Like I've worn dry, like I've got good clothes from there. Like I'm not saying go get your you know your wedding suit there, but like um, you know like I found good dry fits there, some anime tees there. I'm like this is 
it's pretty cool. So I, I, I've, I found myself really like checking the thrift stores first for little things I'm looking for before going on like my Amazon, my targets. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with shopping at these places where, you know, there's convenience first and you get what you want. It's brand spanking new. But I have to say, I, I have become a bit of a thrifter and I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. And I was just curious for you guys, not only uh, if you thrift, but if you did, do you have any scores in particular that you found that like you remember well? Uh, and if you don't thrift, uh, why not? Not that you have to, but just uh, curious to get opposing views on all of this. Jeffy, let's go to you first. Where, where are you on this? Well, my first question is, you know, as somebody who was married for a long time and is no longer married, I wonder if it's one of those things that you do. And then if it wasn't for your wife, like if you guys eventually get divorced, or you, suddenly you're like, oh, thank God that's done. I can fucking go back and buy some new shit, you know, because there was so much stuff. No, because she doesn't limit me. Like she doesn't tell me like, no, you can't buy like shit oh, from well, Amazon. Yeah, now. Thank she God. does limit you. She doesn't tell you she limits you. But oh, I just, I just don't know. Well, I mean, that's how we're, we're all works. on a string here. Yeah, you're right. You know, oh, no, no, I'm not, I mean, women, women <laughs> suffer from it, too. But I'm just saying that it's 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 like, you know, she's not going to say I'm not going to give you a blow job if you don't put up some fucking used curtains. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, if you I if mean you, you ignore <laughs> shit and you don't respect it and act like it's a good idea, life gets a little tricky at times. But um, but anyway, no, I mean, look, I love going to and there's not a really good one when I lived in Santa Monica there was a great consignment store which I know is a little different than thrifting Mm -hmm. uh to some extent I I mean thrift it may actually first educate me there's thrifting like you go to Goodwill that's like Mm -hmm. the official thrifting store and then you can go to retro stores uh which is used stuff like you know we have we have a store in san diego called flashbacks and it's a bunch of stuff from 70s and 80s but it's obviously used and then you go to consignment stores which is where people will bring things in and the owner of the store will say you can have this little section of the store and we'll take a cut and -hmm. you'll get a cut and you know there we go so when you say thrifting is all of that in that pot or is it to my knowledge to my okay. knowledge, like there is like nonprofit places, you, not that I care if they make a buck off of it, but like, yeah, there's there like um, a shop near us. It was like a small little hole in the wall kind of store. And uh, they're like, they volunteer there and just people donate stuff and then they just sell it for cheap. And, and that's really it from furniture to like decorations and stuff. It's pretty cool. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I, I have more experience with consignment stores, but <sighs> that's kind of amazing if you've never been to one because it really is a little uh window into the individual's life who has acquired that little section of the store it's almost mm-hmm. like an art fair and it's like this is my stall right so in san uh in santa monica i remember there was one section that was always like this guy had collected over his life uh oh. political memorabilia right so you got to see all these buttons from like you know 1940 pre- or 42 or whatever it was presidential campaigns and bumper stickers and and just all of this shit and then you'd go next to it and it was just a lady had collected a bunch of fucking cat velvet paintings you know mm. so that was a really it was fun just to shop or to browse it was a wonderful thing to do like hey let's what do you want to do today let's just go walk around the consignment store you know um you know i i i I'm a convenience guy. So I'm not the guy to talk to about fashion. I I don't want to spend a lot of money, but I just go to Amazon. I buy the same shirt every time. Um, And it's totally fast fashion. So it's probably, you know, you can probably see the thumbprints of little kids on it. Um, (laughs) But I, I don't, you know, I don't really do the fashion thing. My kid does. My son, who's 18, he's very much into... Uh, getting weird shirts and band shirts. Um, he also likes to come home and I'm, I'm like, where did you get that? He's like wearing a shirt. Like it's like, uh, you know, truckers do it better. And it's like a, <laughs> a, a big trucker with a cup of coffee. And I'm just like, and I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, it's stupid. That's why I'm wearing it. I'm like, okay. You know, but there's just such weird shit you can get there um, that it is fun. But in terms of your question as to why, uh, I don't do it. I, I guess just as I've gotten older, I've, I've pair, I don't buy a lot of things anyway. Um, but I think if I was still in my phase of like, um, 
action figures and shit like that, I think very much uh, I would probably be doing it because there's a lot of these toys that I grew up with that mm. I'd still love to have. I'd still love to have like the Mego eight inch action figure superheroes or the adventure people from Fisher Price or whatever. Yeah, and I'm cool. sure I could get those uh, or even Atari games. You know, Atari just came out with, uh, a, believe it or not, a new 2600 uh, and it literally plays cartridges mm, and they're selling... That. Yeah. yeah, and they're selling new cartridges. Um, but the old ones, you know, yeah, you can go on eBay, but you can probably go every now and then and find a whole batch of these things for like 10 bucks and take them off somebody's hands. So it's something to think about. I appreciate you bringing up the topic because now I'm kind of like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I should. The last thing I'll say is I saw this. It's, it's tangentially related. I saw this documentary uh on it's not called thrifting but it was there's a town in germany where they do it or at least where they film the documentary and it was sort of about sustainability and everybody shared a lot of things like there were like 20 community bicycles and and everybody just kind of was like you know you take a bike if you need it. everybody had it. a ride everybody, <laughs> in the words everybody, of Austin powers uh, well you know but every you know <laughs> they had that they had uh you know little mini libraries all over the place um mm. if somebody was like hey uh i'm cooking a big dinner i i don't have a big gumbo pot so you just post it and somebody brings it over it's not theirs they're not giving it away it's just this shit is kind of in circulation so i mean there is something very appealing about that which kind of relates to thrifting like when you're saying it's like why would you waste resources on brand new stuff when it's already out there and just sitting there mm -hmm. um so honestly if anything else that i can contribute to the topic it's me going uh I've not thought about this probably in any meaningful way ever. And now that you bring it up, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to start looking into that a little bit more because it, it does seem very logical. Yeah, it, it, it's funny how you brought up. I mean, the consignment stores is something I've never heard of. And I want to look into that because I think you illuminated, put a shine a light on something that I, I, I love about it that I didn't think of, which is you do get to kind of see into like periods of time mm -hmm. people's lives through these thrift stores like you're gonna see stuff from like the 90s and go like what i remember that you're gonna see like abandoned technology i probably no one will ever touch but the fact that it's even there it'll bring back some memories it's kind of like a fun trip down memory lane at the same time which i know for some people who need like quick go 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 it's not for them but like it is it's funny you bring that up because that's another thing i really did find myself enjoying about it. i was like oh wow like I, I i forgot this existed or like you'll find shirts that have like promotions on on brands that existed like two decades ago right and they're like weathered down i'm like this is kind of it's kind of like what your kid was saying like it, it's cool in this weird way like it makes no sense and that's kind of why it's neat yeah um, so yeah, i'm glad you brought that up too because that was a good point i recommend the consignment store experience it's good even if you're not looking to buy if you're like a writer or a songwriter or just looking to have your imagination jogged walking those aisles you can't help but come up with ideas it's like walking into the you know the twilight zone prop room or something i was gonna say i i um touched on this briefly with dustin when i interviewed him about his trip to japan and you might have experienced this when you've gone to japan too jaffe but like the coolest consignment stores i've ever been in were in japan oh wow. i've never they, been to one there they there was one i'll never forget it dude there it was huge it was like multiple stories it must have been hundreds and hundreds of display cases like like uh wow. glass display cases not even your more casual high trust consignment store. And it was all collectibles like anime, video game stuff. And it's like you oh, said, wow. you could see like everyone's fandom in these different cabinets. And that's where I got a bunch of Dragon Quest shit and Mega Man stuff. So cool. While I was there. Cool. I'll never forget that. Consignment stores are really, really neat. But um, Dig, mm. let's go to you. I, I wanted to kick this over to you. I don't know if you remember this or you might even still have it, but you had the coolest Sony shirt in the nineties that you got from a uh, people call it goodwill and it is goodwill, but tell me if I'm wrong on the Island, we would say we were going to the salvation army. That's another, right? that's a different, right? Yeah. Right. But that's like the nomenclature. Adjacent. People yeah. just say goodwill for anything. But for us, that nomenclature, it wasn't always the salvation army. We would just say, we're going to the salvation army. And I remember you getting that dope. You had just, he, it was just a blue shirt that just had a Sony logo on yeah, it. It was sick. And probably like the mid nineties. And we, yeah. I was like, that is the coolest fucking shirt, mm. you know? And, uh, when I was a, but a young fan. And so I'm curious uh, what your experience here is with thrifting. That was a great shirt. I forgot about that. <clears throat> oh, ooh, I know what, I know what I want to talk to you guys about. This is a fun opportunity to get to talk about this. Cause I don't think I ever mentioned it. I think I found this guy on my Instagram feed and hit the whole conceit was this guy would go to thrift stores and he would buy those generic 
mass produced dime a dozen paintings, you know, like, like you'd see in your grandma's house, a mm -hmm. landscape, a seascape, whatever. And you know, like the kind of paintings those. that were for sale in 1960 that were like three for one, you know, and everybody had them. He would take yeah. these paintings and then he would very carefully take them home and he would paint in like a little detail. Like if it was a seascape, he painted in Godzilla, like rising from the water. But That's otherwise, cool. this looked like a normal painting. Kept it in the original frame. You know, he'd have a, a wooded scene like Bob Ross would paint, and there would be like a robot dinosaur in the background or something. Where did, where did this exist in a, this in a is thrift a, store? It, this is an Instagram feed. I wish I knew the guy. I, don't, I shouldn't even say guy because I don't even honestly know if it's a guy or a girl, and I think it pops up in my stories. Yeah. And he'll show like the entire sequence. He fi finds this painting, takes it home. Paints in this detail. He's very, he's like a, he's a brilliant painter. He pays attention to the light source. So it looks like the Godzilla was intended for this painting. That's pretty cool. It's That's such a cool. great idea that, yeah. and I think somebody, I don't know if this is true or not. I think what he would do was he would take it back to the thrift store. That's what I was going to say. That's the <laughs> yeah. perfect ending is to bring I, it back. I you know? love that. Yeah, me too. Because the guy's not even after a profit or anything. He's mm. just, the whole conceit is you could buy this painting now. Or you should bring it back to the consignment store and charge a lot more. And the, it would, that's so perfect. It's such it's a like great, it's, it's like one of those. cents for you to buy the original and he's charging 10 bucks for it because it's got Godzilla <laughs> in it. And I'd buy it for 10 bucks if Godzilla was oh, in dude, it. Oh, dude, it's 30x profit, dude. Yeah. yeah. One of those, like, I wish I thought of that thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you can still do it. You could. But it's, you'd be you copying, know. but you could. And I'm sure this guy is And spawned. you could do different things. I mean, you're the generation. I mean, you work on cartoons and shit. I mean, there's a whole, you know, 20, 30 something now that you've probably worked on cartoons they love. That's true. You know, like all the Nickelodeon 90s shit or whatever. And you could do that, man. That'd be cool. That's definitely true. They're so nostalgic for the stuff, especially early in my career, which makes me feel so old. But it's true. Like even Micah, Micah and Dustin. And Chris would even fit to this category of like they grew up on the stuff that I was working what on. What was in my some 20s. of the biggest stuff you did? The biggest, like probably most popular or household namey type stuff. I mean, Dora, Dora the Explorer oh, wow. was definitely mm -hmm. something that like the original and the reboot, like a couple of years okay. ago. Okay. So that was that was a full circle moment for me. That was probably one of the big ones. And of course, Sesame Street, you know, seasons of Sesame Street, probably six or wow. seven seasons straight. Wow. And Assie McGee. Yeah. And <laughs> Assie McGee. <laughs> Adult Swim or Cartoon Assie Network. McGee? Oh, okay. Do you know that? Do you know I mean, Assie McGee? I love uh, it with all my heart now, though, because it's called Assie McGee. Yeah, it's, it's about, it's like, it's literally a cartoon, like ass on like legs. He's an ass. It's a and buddy cop show, but one of them is just an ass. Interesting. It's, um, yeah, I think I just and Dagan worked on that. That's all. Awesome. That's all. Awesome. Well, yeah, you can. <laughs> and put I think Oscar Adult Swim sort of buried it. Sesame Street characters, like you know, like what paintings would go good with Oscar, or like would go good with Sesame, like weird ones, like you. It's almost like you want to get Nazi paintings and then put the Sesame Street characters, <laughs> yeah, like in, propaganda. You know? yeah, like that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Sesame Street propaganda would be hysterical. I that would come be like on, doing like very again. serious fascistic prints. Yeah, that's got to exist. But, but, yeah, I figure that because that's like the purest, and, most and it's innocent. It's like Big Bird. It's like keep your imaginary friends imaginary. Well, it's, like, it's, it's almost like, like recruiting for a gang or something. Like Sesame Street would be a gang. It's like join, you know, it'd be join and it would be like a, a three quarters thing of, of <laughs> Big right, Bird looking right. to the, up and to the right, you know, yep. with like <laughs> with like some myst mystical logo over it. It would, it, it would be terrible. And I say this as a, as a, I guess I'll just say half Jew so I can get away with it. So fuck you all. Um, they'll have like, uh, cause it's like the count, the count's gotta be a Jew, right? Because of the nose. <laughs> and, and so, you know, if Hitler's doing that shit or Goebbels or whatever, it's, it's going to be terrible on behalf of the count. You think so? I, here's my thought on that is vampires. I always think of Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. obviously, as you know, throughout the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. That's where my, uh, great people ancestors wherever you call him came from so if anything yeah i don't know i mean maybe he'd be the very rare cat jewish count <laughs> the jewish you know? count and people you know the whole myth about jews and money so <laughs> i'm just saying look i was a kid who grew up we had nothing and i kept going where's the money maybe one of the reasons <laughs> i stopped being jewish was i'm like no there ain't no money here trust me the power's off my dad couldn't afford the bill what are you talking about <laughs> Um, but anyway, though, yes, that would be great. And Maddie, I don't 
know if we've fucked your topic. I'm sorry, sir. No, no that's fine. <laughs> Dude, you think I know every, every topic goes left in this show. You got <laughs> the um, the count. I'll tell you about the count. I was involved when I was sort of my last couple of years at Sesame Street. They were really skewing everything towards YouTube and they were open call for pitches. Right. And I pitched a lot of animated vehicles for the count. Him and Oscar oh, probably I pitched like 30 things and they were very. They're they're very conservative with their IP, but sure. the count in particular was like kind of off limits, I felt like. It was Why? like everything I pitched to them was they were just being they were very they were treading very carefully with that character. I don't know. I don't know if they thought he was a little too scary. Count scared the shit out of my daughter. Yeah. When she he's was kind of scary. Terrified, yeah. <laughs> so I so I, I totally get it. But to bring him more online for, for Maddie's topic. I love the I love Maddie's story about getting all the Christmas stuff and yeah. being able to get everything one stop shop for cheap because there's really no better feeling than getting like let's say a piece of furniture for a thrift store taking it home zhuzhing it up little new fresh coat of paint hardware right in fact yeah. I have a I, I'm not good at this but Helene is great at getting like antique or old stuff and then she could reupholster it she'll do the whole nine yards. Like stuff that's completely like out of my wheelhouse. And that stuff I'm more proud of than the pieces of expensive new furniture that we have because she took it and gave it, you know, kind of breathed new life into it. It's not really the, that we saved money. It's just that it's more personal when yeah. you take something and you just kind of make it your own. You just kind of lovingly rehab it a little bit. Sometimes it needs a lot. Sometimes it needs a little. But that I'm curious, was, what's uh, the most, what's the favorite thing you got, Maddie, at a thrift store? Like that, um, emo, not like practical, but like the thing that you're like, this now really is an important object. Um, I love snow globes and oh, okay. I found this Charlie Brown one that I re reminded me of my uncle oh, who passed awesome. away when I was much younger. And I was like, this is kind of special. Like it wasn't mine, but it felt like it was put here for me to find. And that was kind of cool. cool. Yeah. Um, I got this really, I mean, this is more just like, oh, this is sick. It was like this kind of 90s jacket, but it's like a suede kind of green almost, but on the inside are like compasses and maps. It's very different. I don't know. That's you like, open it and go, what you buying? Is that yeah. <laughs> it kind of <laughs> looked to yeah. um, I mean, it. Yeah. It, you mean pictures of compasses and maps? Like that was yeah, the Yeah, like I can yeah. go, here, okay, give me one sec. I'll go grab it yeah, so you guys can the see the Get the globe yeah. too. That sounds like old Banana Republic gear, right? When they oh were like God. really safari. The yeah. whole thing was like safari. That right? was crazy that Banana Republic could be a business for as long as it did. <sighs> and they literally sold safari clothes that you could wear to school. Yeah. It wasn't like now where it's like, you know, they're just clothes. They're like a nicer gap, right? Like that's in the yeah. same family, yeah. right? And they're like the top, company, top tier yeah. of the gap. And then they old are Navy's now. Like but back in the day, yeah, it was right. like pith helmets. Oh, go to Banana Republic. What? <laughs> it really was. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I got it here. So you can kind of see the material I was talking about. Yeah, but cool. then on the inside, this is what I mean. Like it's oh, this sort of yeah. like. That's cool. Yeah, the print like, is cool. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, I was like, that's Fire. sick. I've never seen anything quite like it. So see a little Indiana a Jones plane flying over Easy pickup. Yeah. 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 yeah, Indiana Jones. Exactly. Yeah. Good time, right? Venezia Leathers. I don't know. Like the brands out. I'm sure it's a popular brand, yeah, but I was cool. like, I've never heard of that shit. So. That's pretty cool. That's cool, pretty man. Cool. All right. Well, you know, like what Jaffe I'll was saying it. about your son, like that, when I started thrifting in the mid nineties, it was probably when I moved to Philly. And that was a, I, not only was I dirt poor, but, and back then it was a little better because you could go to a Salvation Army. I remember there was one on 20th and Market and you could get like four t-shirts for a buck. Right. And it was a cool. Mm -hmm. And back then, too, you could get real retro stuff before all the Greenwich Village boutiques, you know, kind of swiped all the t shirts and it's like that, you know, like you're saying that place, what was it called in, uh, in Diego? Oh, Jackie? flashbacks. Yeah. Well, they, you know, they take all the good stuff and then they charge 90 bucks for an actual yeah. 70s t shirt. Right. Yeah. So yeah. back then yeah. in Salvation Army, let's say in 95, you could still get legit stuff from the 80s and maybe even 70s. That stuff was still on the racks. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So you could get the ironic t-shirt. And you can still kind of get it today if you don't go to flashbacks. If you go, like when, when my kid went to uh, Goodwill, he came home. He gave them to a friend because they were too small for him. But 
uh, they found a pair of licensed MCR My Chemical Romance tennis shoes, which they both love MCR. What? And they were both like, they made tennis shoes, but yeah, they, they got them and they were the authentic things and they got them for like 10 bucks. That's so That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. like the draw thing, right? That whole thing of like, maybe yes. you'll hit. Yeah. The only thing I wish about the mid nineties was I wish retro gaming wasn't on my radar yet. And it was still, I mean, we were still kind of in the 16 bit ish generation, sure. but I wish my eyes were peeled for that stuff then. Because I'm sure the thrift stores were full of it in the mid 90s and I wasn't even paying attention. I fucking knew, but I didn't know. I remember walking around comic book conventions and going, it would be so cool one day. And I was already working in games, but it was the first couple of years. Like if video games could have collectors and you could sell all. And so I, I, it was right there top of mind. But it, and I have some valuable games, but it never really occurred to me, dude, you get all this shit for free. You barely have to pay. Just, just get a vault, put it somewhere, retire one day on this shit. But it's, mm. I, I saw it coming and I did nothing. And oh, so man. I don't know what it is today. I mean, pro, you know, I don't know what it's still video games are great collectible now, but I wonder sort of everything is going away. So I wonder sort of in the future, you're not going to have any of that at, at, at thrift stores, right? You're just going to be like, oh, yeah, video game. They stopped making video games, like physical ones, to actually yeah. thrift. Mm, that's a good point. Um, sure. But, Speaking of valuable rare games, I was going to send these to Dagan for our, the Moriarty Family Library, are the CDI Zelda games. Oh, oh wow. wow. Dude, I, so I, sick. I dug out. Do um, you have the CDI, though? No, I don't. Dagan, you, do you? No. No, I don't either. on a console I do not have. When I, Jaffe, if you don't know what, when I move, so Dagan's a games collector, obviously, and I have a shit ton of games as well. And so when I moved back out here, I just sent Dagan all of my games. Well, it actually oh, okay. happened in two waves. I, after college, I gave Dagan all of my games from like NES through, I guess, PS2. And then when I moved back, I sent Dagan all my PS3 and PS4 and, newer and, stuff, yeah. and Vita and all that kind of stuff. So he has an awesome collect, combined collection of, to give to whoever. What's the most valuable? Um, I don't know. Let me think. Uh, old stuff. I mean, we have a bunch of old NES stuff that would be valuable now, but we didn't know right. at the time, really. SNES. The thing that really hurts me, though, Jaffe, that I think about all the time is when I, I think about this all the time is when I bought my PS One in '97. I sold my SNES collection okay. to GameStop. I think it was EP oh, actually, yeah. and they had a thing where it was. I was. I felt like I was getting one over on them actually because I had like. NHL 93, NHL 94, NHL 95, NHL 96, Madden at 93, Madden 94, like all these different things. And, Hi, and, yeah. and so, the, but the thing was, they would never give you less than $5 for a game. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck about Madden 95. Right. Here you go, $5. For, but then they'd be like, oh, I had Final Fantasy 3, Secret of Madden, Secret of Evermore, you know, Seventh Guest, like all of these, rant, Breath of Fire. Right. Luffy, like, oh, whatever, all these random games. And they're like, oh yeah, five, you know, $10, $15. And I remember yeah. going back the next week and this was before games were really a collectible thing and uh seeing my copy of final fantasy 3 like used on a shelf for like you know 50 dollars or whatever it was at the time yeah. The, yeah. the only good news is that i realized like i did that when i was going into eighth grade and then by mm. ninth and tenth grade i kind of oh. had a little bit of money from working jobs or whatever and then i had a real you know i worked in a deli in 11th and 12th grade as everyone knows and i learned early enough to rectify a lot of those like and went back and bought a lot of them more expensive, probably multiple times more expensive, but right. nowhere near. I, yeah. I remember Dragon Warrior four, which was like a really coveted game of mine, was like two hundred dollars complete. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has got to be worth. Oh, yeah. Now. An enormous amount of money Triple now. Complete. At least. Yeah. yeah. So I sold a Klonoa yeah. PS one game uh, mm -hmm. when oh, we were boy. cleaning out the house and uh just this collector rolled in and said, show me your games. And uh, he bought that one for like three fifty. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, thanks. But um, I mean, insane, insane. Yeah, um, I, I will say this though, back in the day, uh, and I, I don't know if I've told you this before, and I think the statute of limitations is expired, so I'm not going to get in trouble. But uh, uh, when I worked for Sony the first couple of years, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of money. I was right out of college. Um, and I, I can't believe I did this, but I guess you do what you do. Uh, but I cannot believe because I'm not a I'm not a break the law kind of guy. But we had these big cabinets of games, you know, and they weren't even 
all our games or like Super Nintendo games. We would just get tons of games in the office because we were a publisher. And I would take them sometimes when I needed money and I would take them down to the used game store and sell them <laughs> and get like 70, 80 bucks and have money for food for the week. And I'm like, I can't believe I did that. But I yeah, did that's so that. funny, dude. I was that's so funny you say that because I was just telling the story and I tell it once in a while. I mean, it's kind of crazy in hindsight. It's deeply seemingly corrupt to do actually in a lot of ways but um and i i was at ign really just as an observer during this uh this period because i was a strategy guide writer but i was telling the story about how and you probably are familiar with this like you would review you would be the xbox editor at ign you would get literally every game sent to you automatically right especially in the physical era yeah. i remember um craig harris who was our nintendo nintendo editor had like literally hundreds of just ran the most random shit all over his desk at all times right and so i was using the example of like you would get um madden 2k7 or madden 2007 on ps2 ps3 xbox xbox 360 ds right. psp whatever and so people and you'd review them you like you'd go through them and check them out and review them or whatever and then these guys would go these editors and i'm not going to name them but there's a lot of them that used to go and just sell all those games back to gamestop the only yeah. rule that you had to do was um to like open it because they wouldn't take they, they it was assumed that it was stolen or whatever if you tried oh, to right. sell it new so you had to well, open the, the game hole, had to be open but a hole would be in it sometimes too but i don't think gamestop cared like on no the back that, that, that would be the case yeah if, but if you were that would be the case if you were getting like early pulled off products like sony would do that right, right. um but if you're getting just sealed copies that are literally just sitting oh. in a warehouse because they just the date is what it is and they're waiting which is right. usually the case for these smaller games it was yeah. never really big games that anyone did or like important games that people did this with. Usually they would keep those games for their own collection. Right. And right. eventually IGN tamped down and I was in charge of it, of, of having an internal library. And we had an insane library of games. I'm sure. Um, and you were internal so, affairs for like you had the snitch oh, no. on. Well, no, no, I, I, I was, <laughs> he was the librarian. Yeah, it was yeah, not like as when, exciting as you make it. Dave. Yeah, no, not at all. When I, I was an associate editor at this time, basically the entire thing was like, we got to stop. We like games are just floating away. We don't we no. don't know in quotes what's happening to them. They all have to go into this library. Oh, it was a literal wow. room. Right. Um, and I was like the librarian of that, which was funny. And that's when this tamped down. And I was I was kind of still writing guides at that time. But I know people that had I was saying like five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars in GameStop credit. Holy shit. Like literally just wow. like on a on a card, just racking things up. And I'm like, that's so deeply corrupt. But I also no, because really if is. I were on the outside, I would think like that's you're on the take. But being on the inside and knowing these people, they were reviewing the game straight up. They were making like forty thousand dollars a year and they literally couldn't give a fuck less about <laughs> like, right. you know, what anyone thinks about that when they were like struggling to make ends meet in some sense. You know, like it actually wasn't corrupt. It just you can totally see why that would come off that way. And it's so funny that no one really talks about that because I remember that clear as fucking day. People that. doing that. Um, I love the yeah. peek behind the curtain. I I, but you had, now you. How did you feel though? Because now you're the guy with the keys to the evidence locker, so you're the asshole. Now I can't yeah. get to the bag of coke. Yeah, we'd you know have like mean? a sign out <laughs> list and all of the rest. And the, and the reality is, is like we would still get multiple games. Like I didn't buy almost anything, but I have hundreds of PS3 games, you know. And those came from my experience working in the industry. But I wasn't. I just had a, a very complete collection of these games or whatever. But eventually they'd have to find their way in. You're supposed to sign them out. I really stopped paying attention. I kind of started. I used to dedicate like uh, a half a day a week sometimes to like organizing it. When we bought one up, they had an even better collection of games and we incorporated all of it. And it was like a nightmare. Oh, so wow. um, you yeah. just put a little don't tread on me Viper hidden like in the note section. So that way, if you bought a game and you saw it, you could like track down the person who yeah. sold it from GameStop. It's like, it's where's like, George? You know, I'm from uh, I'm from Jersey, bitch. You know what else? That's the where the fucking mob is from. You want to fucking take another game? Take it <laughs> off my desk right now. No, no, take it. I'll let you take it. Let's see what happens, fucker. Um, I just have a little fantasy right there. Listen, uh, I don't do it anymore because I just, you know, Sony doesn't really talk to me anymore, except some people you know, inside who will still talk to me, but I haven't talked to Rhodey in a long time, but one of the most, I mean, visiting Rhodey was always a trip and always enjoyable. I love talking to the guy, but he would always get tons of games sent to him. And whenever you would leave, and this was not why I went to visit him, but it just kind of became a pattern. He'd be like, you want some of this? You know, I mean, he was on his floor 
every time you'd visit them, there were it was like Christmas stacks and stacks and stacks of games that hadn't been released yet, but were boxed up like you were saying. And you'd leave there with like 20, 30 brand new fucking games. It was the coolest fucking thing and a great deal of wisdom because you would just sit and talk games with them all day. So, yeah, he was always fun to talk. He he I know I remember his office in San Diego studio. Oh, it's and, amazing. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I had some interesting conversations with him. He's very I haven't talked to him in years either. I don't know. But. He's not really in the eye anymore. You don't really I mean, I know he's still in his position, but I don't really hear from him anymore. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, he has or anything. Yeah, I've always. I've always been curious about what the internal directive was where everyone just kind of went away. <laughs> yeah. I know Connie and all that. Yeah. yeah. Weird. Weird. Um, okay. Sorry. My no, no worries. Bad. So to wrap this up for Maddie, it was funny. You were talking about goodwill and I was bringing up my nephew Declan and I have to give him a shout out because he's really into this stuff as a young kid, which I thought was really, really interesting. And actually, as I've said before, I have this prolific collection of t-shirts and I let him come and basically just take whatever he wanted. And he took a lot of stuff for me. And I go to the house sometimes where we go to a party, or whatever, and he's wearing one of my old shirts, which is, which is funny. Um, Goodwill. I always remember I lived in, in San Francisco. I lived on 25th Avenue and it was right down the street from a Goodwill. It used to be a blockbuster. And I was always fascinated because I, w- I didn't make a lot of money at this time. And I, I didn't really, I, I didn't really understand how it was really working where people would at the very end of the year, like the, the, the between Christmas and New Year's just start piling into Goodwill to donate shit. And I would often donate stuff that I didn't want to clothes or DVDs or whatever. I was just like, you know, take whatever. And they would always ask me like, Oh, do you want to, do you want to like, do you want us to write it up? And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And it's like, people are giving stuff away to these people to write, $50 off your taxes or something. I'm like, that's so crazy to me. And people would just pull up their SUVs with, with enormous amounts of shit in it. And then have this like very detailed write up. And I guess they were using it on their taxes. And I was like, that's so strange. I'll never forget that. And then I want to give a shout out to the YouTuber lazy game review, uh, LGR. He does a lot of thrifting, which is really cool. And he finds like old tech computers, PC games and stuff and plays them or fixes them and stuff. And I really enjoy that as well. And then, uh, just a special shout out to the kind of the corollary to the to the thrift in the thrift store, which is just half the stuff on Antiques Roadshow. I love watching that that show. And a lot of it is just like custom made stuff that could have people found in these situations that are one offs or real paintings or whatever that are truly valuable, like we were saying. And I I think that that's so cool, too. But I'm not much of a I don't like buying things. I don't want too much. I have, you know, my very select things that I want to collect or have or and otherwise I kind of just don't want anything. So um, I'm always looking to get rid of things as well. So I'm like the anti thrifter in some sense. Kyle, but I do you appreciate what you're saying. I'm sorry, Dave. Go ahead. On Antique Roadshow, I saw it recently. It might, again, it might have come up in a feed because I don't usually catch that show. But he had an early Rolex, like one of the first Rolexes in amazing shape. Like I think it was unworn. And it was like four hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something for this watch. The guy's like the guy like wow. you know you're in the, in those situations you think the guy's gonna have a heart attack, you know he just had a, he had a half a million dollars laying around. Yeah, the, it's funny, man. The we I I've been a pretty devoted viewer of this show for like twenty years now, on and off. And people always say when they're confronted with having something truly valuable, they're like, oh, I would well, it's a family heirloom. I'll never part with it and i'm sure a lot of people feel that way but we were watching a special on like a behind the scenes thing and it's so funny so over the years if you watch it you always see it's like the same people like the same antique guys that it's like uh, he's a toy expert he's the electric electronics expert whatever and they were saying like you'll be shocked how many people wait a few days then get in touch with us and say like we want to sell it and and they had specific so they went through a bunch of specific examples from the shows in the past of like people that were like it's a family heirloom or whatever then they realize they're sitting on a hundred and fifty thousand dollar piece of furniture or whatever and they're like oh we'll sell it (laughs) yeah (laughs) can use the money and some of the times (laughs) that they were really undershooting and that things ended up being worth even more like way more Mm -hmm. than they were saying on the show and so it's really really cool so shout out to those guys but um are you satisfied my friend i'm satisfied i have two quick i have two quick questions yeah yeah sorry uh well no what were you gonna say well i was just gonna say i i I did appreciate as a postscript maddie your invite or maybe you know maybe your significant others i should say environmental view of things Mm -hmm. as opposed to your own but yeah i appreciate that because i'm trying to kind of tune in with that myself um where it it, like I, i bought solar panels for my house and basically i'm just totally neutral on electricity actually we're pumping electricity back and get in making money on it now which is cool and getting carbon credits for it which is awesome and 
it's great for money. It was expe- really expensive to get the solar panels. It's going to take years to pay that, like to actually make my money back. But it felt good to not to just be like one little grain of sand of change yeah. or whatever, where like it's like, OK, maybe I'm a little more on the neutral side now. Not that I'm like I'm an, I consider myself an environmentalist. I think a lot of there's a lot of fucked up shit happening in the environment. I also think a lot of it is probably overstated in some sense or the environment changes sure. all the time and can adapt. Sure. But I don't want to just fuck things up to fuck things up. So if we can have a way to have no impact, I think that that's obviously the idea. Yeah. So it's cool to hear you talk yeah. about that. No, no, because I, I for me, it was like, you know, I was definitely in that camp of like, I don't give a fuck. But like, um, you know, when it wasn't even like stats or anything, when she, it was more so I thought it was just going to be so inconvenient. And when she showed me how like easy it is to do, I was like, OK, well, if this is part of the solution and it's fun to do, you know, am I really disrupting my life? I mean, this is like years ago when I started to, to really shift uh, my tone on it. But. Yeah, you know, there are little things like that. I, I maybe not little given the cost of it, but big things I got to do, like like solar panels. But yeah, I definitely came from the side of the camp. that was like, all right, well, like, who cares? I'm going to still shop at Amazon. It's like I still do from time to time, but it's like you do a little less here or there. And, you know, it's I think it's a, a culmination of little choices, right, is what I think about it. Mm. Like, I still tell people, like, go ahead, shop at Amazon. But like they have options that put it all in one box and you wait maybe an extra day. It's like those little things do make a difference. But, you know, it's up to. I think when you beat people people over the head with it is when they're just like, no, I'm not doing that. It's like, I get it because it's it's all we hear about constantly. So it's like, you know, people just want to live their lives. But uh, yeah, it's why I I've, I've ended people, up taking it up. And uh, it's it's been nice, but, you know, maybe it's not for everyone. I, I think on that, I'll, I've given up on a lot of that, truth be told, because uh-huh. I, I do believe in it. I think it's important to some extent, but the, it, it, it it's like training, you know, it, I don't even want to do an analogy. It, it's just if you look at the amount of pollution and waste that it, it, you know, that these companies and the government does, and it's like, oh, you should, you know, you should recycle your boxes. It's like, sure, sure. It's a drop <laughs> in it. the fucking ocean. Yeah, and it's I like told, it's, it's yeah. not that it's bad to do, yeah. but it makes me kind of go, is this just some diversion of of making me feel like I'm doing something when I'm actually. Mm-hmm voting in fucking politicians that are going to, you know, give away the farm anyway. Point is, Dagan, Green Stamp Store. Do you remember Green Stamps? You may be the only person old enough to remember Green Stamps. I don't think I remember. No. All right. Don't worry about it. Now, the other thing, the last <laughs> thing I was going to say, uh, I, I, I watch documentaries from time to time because I miss the VHS era. Mm. And there's a number of documentaries about people who collect VHS tapes. And... Uh, they'll get them obviously at thrift stores and they'll get them at flea markets. And I was fascinated to learn this. Do you, does anybody know what the, <clears throat> the number one uh, VHS, uh, like the, the most uh, plentiful that you can see it even to this day, you'll, you'll see it guaranteed anywhere you go that sells use VHS thrift hmm. stores or what have you. Would it be like, oh. like Titanic or something like that? It's the two tape Titanic. Oh yeah. my uh, God. That, makes that probably can you imagine how many copies that sold? I know. I, I was mean, thinking the makes... other thing would have been the Star Wars black box ones, but people probably buy those. But yeah, those, yeah they made a bajillion of those too. Um, yeah, I was amazed. It's so funny because every documentary is like, oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. That was the so. last vestiges of VHS that era. That was yeah. kind of the the nail in the coffin right there. Dude, I just re- it's so funny that just that that classic double box people don't people younger people won't even remember. Like there are movies in my mind where I'm like, oh, that's a double box movie, Braveheart. Or yeah. heat, yeah. right? Yeah. Like just just from seeing them in Blockbuster, and they had a little bit more intrigue. Gods and Generals, yeah. I remember being a really late one. Um, at, I remember seeing that in the theater and having a fucking intermission. And I'm like, "There's an intermission in this movie." Yeah, that's crazy. Debbie does all of Dallas. That was a two tape. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, are you talking about S and H Green Stamps? Was yes. a line of trading stamps popular in the United States from 1896 until the late 1980s? I don't that's know. That's right. They were distributed was, as was, part of a rewards program operated by the Sperry and Hutchinson Company founded in 1896. Yeah. So it, it was always there was uh, oftentimes it was next to a Goodwill store, at least where I grew up, um, like all over Alabama. They had them next to them and you would check out at the grocery store and you'd get these little green stamps. And my grandmother would collect them and you'd put them in a book and you'd get like it was like rewards programs and you would go into the green stamp store. And if you've got five books, you could buy a couch or whatever. It was, oh, wow. it was kind of cool. I put the Wikipedia. Cool. If you guys want to check it out there, just, that's pretty neat. Right there's pictures of the store, the stamps, the books and all the rest. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right, my friend. Well, are you satisfied, Maddie? Yes, completely. All right. 
Is your wife satisfied with that? Can you check with her, make sure we talked about it properly? I'm fucking with you, man. You know that, man. No, I know you are. I hope I I don't come across sensitive. I don't want to. You don't come across (laughs) sensitive. I was just laughing because Colin's like, are you satisfied? I looked at Colin, I'm like, we almost sat on that for 50 minutes. I did not expect that. Like, yeah, I'm good. (laughs) All right. Let's, um, I'll go to myself because I guess it's, we're in the kind of the commercial point of view so we can get this through this and I don't think it'll take very long. I was thinking just about like, what brands are in your life that you're loyal to? And um, I, don't, I, I think I, I want to hear weird answers or not weird answers, but answers you wouldn't think of from from everyone. So what we're loyal to. Yeah. Like, mm. yeah. Like you go Define into a store loyal. and there's no there's just it's obvious. That's what you're going to buy. You go mm. to a you go to buy something like you go to a certain type of store and it's obvious. Yeah. So you want to go to a deli or something or you want, you know, like you go to Wawa or Sheets or you go and buy ketchup. Do you buy Heinz or Hunts or do you buy Hellman's or Dukes or whatever the case might be? Ooh, it I doesn't like have to this. reduce to only that because I, I was just curious, like what brands you grab. Hey, what brands do you gravitate towards in any way that might be off the beaten path? Because obviously, like, I, yeah, I gravitate towards PlayStation. I gravitate towards those things. But what in right. your daily life? I'm curious. Food, you know, mm. uh, toiletries. Right. I don't know. Cars, gas delis i mean i don't know i so like funny you brought up gas yeah <laughs> i like exclusively <laughs> go to one. sunoco <laughs> i just don't know I, I think my dad was like i think my dad told me when i was really young he's like yeah they i don't even know if this is fucking true by the way they're like yeah we get we, they get the gas from america he's like we should always get gas here i was like okay i'll just do that then i just never go to any other gas station i'm just like a sudoku diehard that's so funny you brought that up I wouldn't that have is funny that. that is really funny yeah i mean Brand loyalty at the you know what I think of because my family the were such a bunch of pansies toilet paper that's a huge one. oh yeah that's a huge one I used to buy Cottonelle because I thought hey that's a good brand name it's always one of the pricier brands has the it's plush right it's not sandpaper in any way it's a, it's a higher quality toilet paper and then I was told years into my marriage like why aren't you buying the Charmin. And I was like, I thought we were agreeable on Cottonelle. Now, Charmin was the only one more expensive than Cottonelle. And I think that was the problem with these bougie asses in this house. Mm. Right. So then I had to start buying the Charmin. Jaffe, you read my mind. Because yep. that was. The, I, I, can't, I can't. When I hear people talking about toilet yeah, paper, you, I just. You read can't. my mind. Yep. <laughs> you, so wait, you, uh, Jaffe put a bidet link into the chat. Mm. Did you use a bidet as well, Maddie? Oh God, yeah, bro. Really? Well, imagine it's, the with this, with this European sensibility. I this don't understand. It's a big thing. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's, it's very uncomfortable for me to do. I use the wet wipe, but okay. you know, like as the last wipe, you know. I and feel then you, like that's you use the wipe, the, the wet wipe at the end, like the adult wipe, wet wipe, and then you you do one more regular wipe. And you, no, of course, yeah, yeah I yeah. understand yeah. though. But imagine People, if you just hosed your ass and called it a day, right? And it's but, so. It and honestly feels good. I don't know. I, I'm just like, oh man, that that was a good one. You tickled <laughs> your butt a little bit, yeah. Because I, I, well, because no, I, I do say this all the time that I, I, well, not I don't want to say often, but probably like one in four, one in five times, maybe not so many. I, I'll go just take a shower, like you know, wipe and then go take it. It's like you got to kind of get restart refresh yourself but i don't really feel like i'm taking like mega catastrophic poops at the same time very often where it's like wow what did i what have i done i need to oh okay it's become about, french right. no I mean, it's I not about that it's just it's just the the awareness at any given moment that your butthole is clean and doesn't smell like shit <laughs> most people <laughs> most people who don't use bidets i mean not that i have the experience but i'm like if you're walking around the office and nine out of ten people have toilet paper down there, and it smells like shit. And there's a little fecal paste hanging on to the fucking <laughs> rim there, the butthole. It's That's pretty, what most people graphic. are walking around with, right? Even when you're listening to this podcast, it may be a year from now, and you're listening to this, and you're driving to work. Think about how nasty your ass is right now if you were using today. <laughs> That's true. There's a couple true. of people in our lives, like two specific good friends of ours, that sing the praises of having like one of them got their master bathroom redone in a like complete Japanese style with the bidet Mm. as like the centerpiece like the whole idea was like we're gonna get a bidet into this bathroom and then the other one is such a propri like such a proponent of this that gave my wife like a bought her like a I guess one that's interactive with your basic toilet 
you know, so like yeah. a cheaper version, like a proxy. Yeah, you don't have to buy a full on new toilet. Most people do. I mean, most people just I know, including me, just have attachments. It's attached. Like, right, like right. That's what's on Yeah, Dustin, Dustin believes in that it. too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, people, people love it. I mean, I don't, you know, I wasn't intending to talk about toilet paper. But that's a, that's a pretty interesting one. I mean, you know what I was going to say with brand loyalty? I mean, two things before I, before I turn it over to the next person. One, I've never really been burned on a brand that I like, and I'm afraid it's going to happen. Like with a car brand, gasoline is really important. That's a, that's a huge one, especially because it's so expensive today. But I think about my earliest like brand loyalties and sort of working it out as a kid. And you know what it was probably being in my early teens with Nintendo, with the 8-bit NES mm. and just recognizing like, all right, first party Nintendo, Capcom and Konami. If I rent those games, or if I, God forbid, shell out 50 bucks at Toys R Us or KB, I'm not going to get burnt on those. And just recognizing like brand names and video games, you're not going to regret buying those three, Nintendo, Capcom, Konami. You're not LJN. Gonna regret- <laughs> LJN. 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 <laughs> Except there were those rare anomalies, right? Like remember Mickey Mousecapade on the NES? It was a Capcom game, but it, was, it wasn't developed by Capcom. And even as a kid, you recognize that. You're like, wait, this doesn't have like a Mega Man, you know, Chippendale, DuckDales type quality to it. This is a little bit. And it was developed by Hudson Soft or something. Mm. And there was like, all right, that that computes. So there were anomalies. Sony but- Image Soft. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I started. Oh my God, those were terrible. But I'm always afraid. I'm always afraid I'm going to get burned, especially on the car brands, because usually what attra- I, I love cars, but usually attracts me to cars is cosmetic. It's the appearance of a car, right? That's what that's that's what draws you in, and it hasn't. I should knock wood. It hasn't happened to me yet, but I'm always afraid I'm going to get burnt on. It. And you know what the other thing is too? When you re, when you get old enough, you realize you kind of gotta you gotta increase your scope a little bit. You gotta cast a wider net. Like there's other. You don't have to just stay plugged into. Like I love San Pellegrino, but it's okay to drink Perrier, right? Because I can't mm. drink sugary drinks. Right. I could drink polar. I could drink any kind of salt. It's a, it's okay. You know what I mean? You don't have to be uh you don't have to be a one trick pony when it comes to the brand names. But isn't it but don't we do we all agree that there's a difference between Coke and Pepsi and then everything there is that's a big like difference. it. There's a taste in fla- a difference in flavor. Here's it's so yeah. like it's so I think RC Cola and stuff like that is so abominable that I can't believe. And and it's like, we're looking for a cheap replacement to the cheapest thing in the world. Listen, if you can't afford a bottle of Coke, just drink water. It's okay. Like it's better <laughs> than drinking out, this than buying, than bu- spending half the money buying Royal Crown. You know, it's uh, rough, all, I have dude. to defend RC Cola. Uh, it's not bad. It's pretty fucking good. Uh, I like it. It's not Tab. Tab's disgusting, right? Oh, but RC man. Cola... I, I, but I hear your, your, your point is a valid one, which is RC Cola. We, I take issue with, but yeah, you know, but let me tell you something there. I'm so addicted to the aspartame and diet Coke that, you know, that sometimes I will spend 30 bucks to get a Coke in the morning um, because I don't want to go leave. <laughs> and so I'll DoorDash, but the DoorDash minimum is like, you know, 16, 18 bucks. And there's the tip, the delivery fee. Oh my God. So I'll order like shit from McDonald's. I don't even want just so I get a nice big fucking huge Coke with ice. It's a horrible addiction. But yes, Pepsi shit. It didn't used to be. Pepsi tastes horrible. I can't drink it. Interesting. I'm, oh. I'm on. I vacillate back and forth and I've been on like a multi year. I'll drink Coke or Pepsi. I don't care. But for buying in the house, I have one Pepsi a day with dinner. Just a can yeah. of Pepsi. And uh, I'm I'm into it right now, but I I always just remember you guys probably have the same memories and dig. I know you do is like the the random pizza place on the island or whatever that would give you like oh you get like a free RC cola with your it's like you keep that <laughs> I'll just <laughs> eat some pizza yeah, and like you it. you keep the RC cola you give that to someone else I don't and I'd be so I remember being like when you're a kid and you're excited to go to a party or whatever and you're crestfallen, it's like, RC Cola, no! <laughs> Wasn't it though, Kyle? I don't know. Would you guys agree with me on this? Like Coke and Pepsi fine. welfare, you have RC Cola. Uh, I know. <laughs> Can't be at this welfare party. Big one. Royal Crown. 
right? Yeah. Or a store brand, Cola, whatever. Oh, yeah. Grandma and Grandpa used to buy this other brand that was like a kind of a knockoff brand. I can't remember what the <laughs> White Rock such or a something. Grandparent yeah, thing yeah. to do. Yeah, totally. They would also be the ones, Jaffe, that would, they're the only people I've ever known. I don't even see them in the store. They must have materialized them, was that they would buy the, the Coke, the diet, caffeine free, Coke or whatever that had yeah. like the very special gold and dark oh, red right. label yes. or whatever. You have to like yeah. dig deep or like know someone to get that shit. <laughs> you know, that would be super, yeah. that would be one thing. Really and they tried to get more. dad. And I'm not making fun of people that had to buy RC Cola as a kid or did because dad tried to sneak one by the goalie once or twice. And, and I think he learned pretty early. Like you're not even as like a six or seven year old. I'm like I'm not drinking this. Yeah, you know? but was it? So, what I was saying though was it the, <laughs> the flavor? At least we're like this. is What we had in the depression. That's what yeah. we know. <laughs> was it the flavor though, or was it the tendency to just lose carbonation super quick? Like it didn't hold on to the suds. It just tasted different. The shitty soda. It just tasted different. Like now, Coke and Pepsi taste different too, but they both taste good. This just tasted like a weak attempt at making Coke, and mm. I find it offensive. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, in the south it's a thing like moon pies and rc cola it's kind of like a tradition so i grew up with it and i never i knew it was always in third place like it, it's kind of the yeah. uh, it's kind of the xbox For of sure. uh, of sodas um but uh <laughs> you, you know but i always enjoyed it as much um and pepsi back in the day was awesome there was something they did where they changed the formula. I don't know if you remember this, Colin and Maddie. I think you're younger than everybody here. Um, I'll try my best. But but <laughs> Pepsi had this competition back in the day where if you could, uh, you uncapped your Pepsi and you took the plastic and pulled it back and there was a letter. And if you could spell catch that Pepsi spirit, you would win like a million dollars, you know? And R was the letter nobody could find. And it was just like for a month, everybody was like, racing for the r uh i don't know if that ever was a thing where you were but uh dagan but that was our generation i That's remember that did. yeah i don't they don't do that stuff as much anymore but that was never printed the r the best we knew dagan and i well our sister n- knew people at mcdonald's like one person in particular they got fired during the early monopoly days because they would like <laughs> take a, they would like steal like cups or whatever and like try to get monopoly pieces to End up. Have you seen yeah. that documentary about the mob and the McDonald's monopoly thing? I don't think so. Yeah, no. I, I haven't. I haven't either. But apparently, the the one of their McDonald's monopoly things was sort of a, a mob cover up or something. Oh, and interesting. Was, I've, I keep seeing the trailer, but I haven't watched the movie yet. Yeah, it's but. Netflix, no. I think. Right? Oh, I yeah. Think I saw that yeah. a while ago. Yeah. All right. So, Maddie, where are you on a uh, brand loyalty? What comes to mind for you? The, the the random brands in your life that you gravitate towards? While we were talking, I was just rattling my brain on I, I was trying to think of you know because Dagan was walking us through the process a bit of like the safe purchase that you never let me down and the ones that you just always go to cross your life so I was rattling my brain a bit on like what would those be nature made was one that came to mind I take a set of vitamins every morning and I had these I've had these stretches where like you, know, you go to CVS or wherever or like Sometimes I had to pick them up at Walmart, my old place. And like, uh, you know, you just, oh, they don't have nature made. And you you buy them. They're like these cheap knockoff ones. But I'm like, these can't be as good. Right. And like I had for a while, I don't use only nature made now. But for a while, it was like, if you're not nature made, I don't want your vitamins. And so that was one that like I felt like it's my health. I had reliable results because like I had like this feeling of uh of like a depression. And then like I started taking vitamin D supplements um, as per a recommendation from my doctor. They're like, you know, you, this might help you out. And it did. It was nature made. And because I had that tangible effect, I was like, well, I'm not going anywhere else. Like I can't, that was a lifeline right there. Like I got to hang on to that. Obviously I've, I've grown out of that, but um, it's interesting that you're I'm like, well, was that a placebo effect now? Hmm. Um, but nonetheless, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, Jim shark, Jim shark, is a online i think they're based in the uk but for me online clothing brand that uh, makes dry fits uh, makes sweatpants um and i all of my gym wear is from there like i i get made fun of by everyone that i am always because i'm always wearing comfy clothes at home i am always decked out in like full-on gym shark stuff for my socks to my underwear to my pants to my shorts to my shirts i love gym shark I just always go to them because I like nice, breathable clothes. I was thinking back to high school, McDonald's, 
I was extremely slanderous towards the likes of uh, Burger King, especially Wendy's. I can't fucking stand oh, Wendy's. What? You yeah, I know. everyone says that. I know. I I, know, I acknowledge it's a bit of a hot take, <laughs> but just mm. I think you know what it was. McDonald's. You got so much for your money. I haven't shopped at McDonald's obviously in in ages. You but shop. I've never heard anybody. Yeah, actually shop. Shop. I haven't. I haven't eaten. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That is I haven't perused their wares in a while. Yeah. Um, a McDonald's, I haven't ate there in, in a hot minute. Yeah. And uh, when I did go there, like, for example, you know, I hated the orthodontist. I hated this fucking dude with the passion. Cause my, I just ached every time after I came home from there. So my mom being the wonderful woman, she, she is not let him put his dick in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> he was twisting <laughs> something in there, man. That shit hurt. <laughs> Um, Listen, shut up. It's sometimes my brain goes to these. <laughs> Maddie, continue. I'm sorry, sir. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, McDonald's, though, was the place we went to after the orthodontist appointment. And for like 20 bucks, I'd get like they had a grilled honey mustard snack wrap. Mm-hmm. I'd get like a couple McDoubles, a 20 piece nugget, large fries, large soda. I don't know how I maintained a weight of like under 120 Sounds throughout like high me. school. But I was I was large and in charge of my diet. And so, yeah, McDonald's is one. Last one, though, I thought of because I was looking at my computer cyber power. I have only built my computers with cyber power. I don't know what mm. life is like beyond their, their pre-builds. Um, I just pick out my parts there, and they put it together for me. They've never let me down. I'm like, well, I've always been on the pre-built wave. Like, I always thought, you know, like some people are like, no, you got to get intimate with your PC. You got to build it yourself. You got to know. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm a console player. No, I don't. I don't want to do that, but I want to access PC games. And uh, Cyber Power has made my life easy since 2012. So uh, they have not let me down. I'm on like my, I think, third or fourth pre-built from them. Uh, actually, the one time I went away from them, I got one from Amazon to start up Retro Rebound just because I needed a separate PC in a different room in my old uh, studio space. And that shit broke in a year. I was oh, like, wow. that, would, that wouldn't have happened with Cyber Power. That wouldn't have happened. So um, yeah, th- those are some weird random examples of brand loyalty throughout my life that came off the top of my head. Um, I think what I try to do, again, tailing off what Dagan said, I think about it more when I'm in the grocery store, right? Like if I see like the great, like I'm very selective of when I do the, the great value brand stuff or the the Amazon Whole Foods market brand stuff. Like I try to get picky about that. Like how detrimental to this, to me, will this be if I buy the cheapest version of this? Is my bottom line worth it? Is it worth my health or what am I trading off here? And then I make my decision. So I guess that's where the brand loyalty really kicks in because I think they're all the fucking same. Yeah, my parent, our parents were value shoppers, including like back then, like you were brand. I was so embarrassed walking around the supermarket because the generic brand was like a white box. Yeah, no frills. It was called no, no frills. frills. Yeah. And I purposely just won't, it's stu- stupidly won't even go there because I'm just so, I always swore to myself, I swore that oath. I would never do that, you know? And it, I'm probably spending, a lot more money than I need to because I just hold on to that that trauma. I'm I'm very white. selective about store. Sometimes with store brands, I'm like whatever, I don't care. And then sometimes like, oh my god, depends what it is. Like never would I have a store brand of that, you know? So it it does depend. That makes that makes sense. I mean, that's good at least. Like you don't want to get store brand. Like I don't like the store brand cold cuts. I don't even like Deets oh, and no. Watson. Like it's got to be Boar's dude. Head. Boar's Head. Oh, of course, of course, of course. Right. Store brand condoms are the worst. Store brand <laughs> condoms, yeah. <laughs> I got three kids in Jersey. I don't know where the fuck they are, but I'm pretty sure they're there. I hate it. Jeffy, where are you on uh, some random brands that you're loyal to? Well, I mean, there's the, the you know, loyalty is a, uh, a word. Loyalty and the word brand don't really work with me because I'm not, you know, but I know I know what your question is. But yeah, like what brands do you, you trust? Know, every, let's say? Everything can change. Yeah. Right. For a long time, it was Apple. And I was one of those Apple diehards. And then as much as an asshole as Steve Jobs was, he died and it becomes this kind of very predictable company and I've lost a lot of interest. So, uh, you know, at the big end, I mean, I, I still very much Marvel will always be, you know, and I know we're going to talk store goods, but in terms of the big stuff, Disney and Marvel and Capcom, I think are always going to be, uh, Unless just because they've been able to be consistent for so long, even though I know people bitch about Disney and Marvel, it's I I grew up with it. I love it. Okay, smaller stuff though, uh, Diet Coke, um, and then New Balance. At this point, Mm -hmm. I just buy New Balance shoes on Amazon. I've never. It's been decades since I bought anything else. I don't even have to try them on. I know they fit. They're killing off Amazon. Uh, Dickies shirts. 
These are Dickies. They're like 14 bucks. They're really nice, thick, heavy t-shirts. I hate these fucking thin t-shirts. So, and you know, I, I know it's fast fashion. It's probably not ethically made. Um, but I do that. Um, and then, you know, it was interesting when the, when the COVID stuff was going on and the vaccines were out, I remember gravitating to Pfizer just cause I was like, Oh, that's a bigger company. And I don't know why. I mean, I'm sure I was doing a little research on the Johnson and Johnson virus and Pfizer and Moderna. And I'm like, well, I hear about Pfizer a lot and I see their ads a lot. So I'm going to go with that. So, I mean, it does play a role when you don't really think about it. Um, and then I've never gone wrong with a redheaded hooker. I think though that's because they try harder because a lot of people make fun of gingers. And I think that's so stupid. Well, no, no, because I like redheads. I think like um, Mary Jane Watson and stuff. And I, I don't know why people oh, use a ginger, but whatever it is, it's in the water and a lot of redheads maybe feel self-conscious. So they do try harder. Um, so those in are your the experience. brands. <laughs> well, it's well, anecdotal. Who else? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah. Your yeah. lived experience. It's a My lived experience. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I guess I can wrap this up. I have a few different ones. I, I getting out of outside of games. I I thought a, a funny one for me was um, the Pilot Pen Company. Mm. I I am obsessed with the Precise V5 Extra Fine Point Pen. I buy these by the dozens, basically. And I love to write by hand, as everyone knows. So it's important to have a pen you really like. And I fell in love with this pen randomly when I worked at IGN. And they just had them. You know, you go into a closet and you just get what you need. And I was like, what is this pen? And I just fell in love with it. So shout out to the Pilot Precise V5 Rolling Ball Pen. Extra <laughs> somebody, fine. Somebody clip that and tweet it to them so Colin can get those for life just sent to him for free. Yeah, that would be sick. Yeah, yeah I, I I don't mind you know you got I don't mind putting my money where that my mouth is very affordable. I understand. You know, very You'll affordable get it for free. Free's good. Um, another. So I was thinking about some food, and I was thinking I am a Heinz. I am probably in the top one percent of Heinz ketchup consumers. <laughs> I love Heinz ketchup, and I eat ketchup on so many things that you shouldn't eat ketchup on. And it's not like gratuitous amount. I just like dipping a little bit of whatever. You know, you're eating like a chicken breast. You just dip a little bit of that in ketchup. You know. Obviously, your fries. I say, and it's very Japanese, but ketchup with or mayonnaise with rice is really good. Those are both very Japanese things to do. But Heinz ketchup. Now, Hunt's ketchup, all these other ketchups, they're fine. But Heinz ketchup is very specific. And I get bummed when you go to a restaurant. And unless you're at a nice restaurant, they make their own ketchup. That's fine. That's totally cool. But it's like, dude, stop. You're not splitting the atom back here. You're making this nice burger. It's really nice and boutique and and well done, handcrafted. Just give me the fucking Heinz ketchup, please. You know, let's not make it. Let's not complicate it with the, all this. Or when they're like, oh, we have a fresh aioli. It's like, just give me Hellman's mayonnaise. <laughs> you don't have to get crazy. You, I appreciate it. If we're at a nice restaurant, yeah, nice aioli. OK, but if we're you don't have to. It's like trying to say, like, we're going to make our own Coca-Cola. It's like, no, just give me Coke. Even though I'm in a nice restaurant, if I ask for like a Coke, just give me Coke. Kyle, so I think I know the answer to this already. Yeah, yeah. But now you have a choice because Heinz has, I don't know if it's called Heinz Free or Heinz Pure. Oh, yeah, but without I, I the, guess the conceit is it's not high fructose corn syrup, it's sugar. Yeah, I had I had that at a, uh, when Derek, our brother-in-law and I went out for beers a time or two ago, we went to a place, like a sausage place, and I had that for the first time. And it was good, but it was not, it's not, no, I, I don't mind high fructose corn syrup. It's a bountiful product in the United States. We should use it. You'll take it the old fashioned way. Yeah, like I, okay. I just, I understand why people around the world use sugar. And I understand why they think it tastes better. I think it tastes, I think what, like, I don't think Mexican Coke tastes anything remotely as good as as American Coke, in my opinion. Oh, that's and a lot of people think that, and a lot of it is like the real sugar stuff, but I think it's what you're used to. And I understand why products around the world use that, but we have so much corn that we definitely would be stupid not to use it. And uh, so I have no problem with that personally, but I go through so much ketchup. We get the three pack over at BJ's, the price club, the satchel mm -hmm. of ketchups, as it were. <laughs> So shout How out to them. How quick do you go through those? Do you know? Um, I probably go through a bottle like every few weeks, probably something like that. Okay. You know? That's yeah. reasonable. Um, and then I love Hellman's mayonnaise, which is known as best mayonnaise on, in the West Coast. And, but it's the same product. And I switched over here in, this, in, the, in the upper south to Duke's when I moved over for a little while. And Duke's is really good too, but I went back to Heinz or to, uh, to Hellman's recently. I like Hellman's mayonnaise a lot. And then in the bathroom, dial soap. Mm. I'm a fan. I'm a big, I'm a hardcore fan of the traditional liquid orange dial soap. 
It's very nostalgic for some soap reason, the smell of it, head. but it's like the, it's yeah. like the classic antibacterial soap. Mm-hmm. And I, that's the shit. And I buy the bar version of it, too, for the shower. I like um, the very foamy soap because there are soaps that just are designed to dry out your hands and turn them into prunes. Like I'll literally <laughs> see my knuckles start to like crust over and totally. bleed if I squeeze a fist. Hate that shit. And then for showering shower gel, I use I'm, I'm, a, I'm an Irish spring guy through and through. And then for shampoo, head and shoulders. I've used head and shoulders for probably 20 years. I never had like active dandruff, but my, what, living in Boston. So when I moved from Long Island to Boston, where it's way colder, my I started getting like really itchy. And I was like, I think this is how it all begins. So in college, I was like, I just started using it. And then I'm like, oh, this is great because it's just it leaves your hair very or at least my like very, hair very soft. It's like very it's not harsh at all. And I never had a problem with itchiness again, therefore never had a problem with dandruff and just kept kind of using it. Toothpaste, Crest Pro Health. Oh, toothpaste is a good one. Only yeah. Crest Pro Health for me. 3D white for me. 3D yeah. white. Okay, yeah. So you have yeah. your preference, right? Yeah, absolutely. And cool Listerine one. is what I use for mouthwash. I just rinse a little bit, you know, which, before which I brush. Yeah. Um, oh, which oh. color? I'll yeah. do blue or green. Depending on, yeah, I the, like the this classic blue. gold the is too hard like for me. The, the purple is the purple. one I like. Yeah. Purple. As long as my gums start to sting, I'm like, good, I'm doing yeah, something. Then you know it's working. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did move over to Crest Pro Health's like blue stuff for a little while and then found out that it's like, I don't know if it was Mike or so. The dentist told me, it's like, if you keep using this, it does end up staining your teeth. And I'm like, really? That's oh, so wow. strange That's for hard. mouthwash. So never really looked into it, but. Huh. Just switch back out of fear. It could have been a Listerine propaganda piece for all I know. But I but I do know that the it's funny, man, the gold Listerine. I, I can't believe people for 80 percent of Listerine's life cycle. Like that's what it was. And that's some yeah, hardcore that's shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it um, hurts. It's painful. Yeah, it really is. Like I, I, I kind of dig it in a way because it's like that's, you know, you're like just nothing's living yeah. after that inside <laughs> your mouth. <laughs> like right. no matter what it feels like, you know, you've like atom bombed your mouth basically. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like hot ones, though, right? Like, how long can you maintain keeping it? Yeah, I can never do the full minute with a real one. No, No, it's a minute. Yeah, yeah. Holy shit. And I learned a thing. This is something I, you know, I'm going to pass on a little piece of knowledge. This is what I've been doing since I was in college. I, 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 I was just it's so funny. I was just reading a random Amazon review in college. This was a long time ago. And it was like, I'm a dentist. And uh, who knows if this guy was like trailing the truth. It was on like some Listerine page or something. And he's like, what I do is you know, you rinse and then you kind of take a brush and just brush inside your mouth with it before you brush your teeth. And then it kind of loosens everything up and mm. kind of gets everything going. And I've done that ever since. Yeah, that makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. That's yeah. A good Did tactic. you see the CES toothbrush? I'm as an ADD guy. I mean, I, I brushing my teeth twice a day is I do it, but it's hard because it's so boring to me. Um, but CES revealed there's or, or there was a, a toothbrush that kind of looks like a uh, you know, like when you get x-rays of your teeth and they make molds and mm-hmm. you, you put your teeth in it and you put the toothpaste in it and you just turn it and it's just like, zzz, and like in a minute, your entire, it's every tooth has gotten front, back, everywhere. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Is it like so vibrations will, or something like some yeah, subtle vibration yeah. or something? That's cool. Yeah. I hope it works. I hope it's actually effective once it goes on the market because I really want that. I saw something cool at CES, like it's basically just a dehumidifier, but like kind of a commercial grade thing where you can take water out of the air like natively and then just create drinking water out of it, like right before your eyes. Oh, it was wow. pretty, oh, yeah, pretty re- a, like not a whole lot of it, but it's pretty remarkable. I was like, wow, that's kind of crazy. It's, it's a licensed product with Dune 2 coming out. I yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, a few other a few other things. It clothes Adidas for sure. Mega loyal to and Mac Weldon for sweatpants. I've spent. So I discovered Mac Weldon when they first sponsored Sacred Symbols back in 2018, I want to say, and legit became a just a hardcore customer of theirs. And they don't sponsor the show anymore, which is a shame because I'm like, <laughs> dude, I, I live in your sweatpants. Love it. <laughs> and then uh, two other things I wanted to say before we go. You had brought up, Jeff, you had brought up Apple. Mm-hmm. I'm incredibly loyal to Apple. It's probably the only electronics company I am truly loyal to. I don't really care otherwise from like your consumer grade electronic point of view. I just find their products so consistently good and they sing with each other. They don't even talk do. with each other. They like they like really sing with each other. Like they they understand they the way the watch works with the phone, the way the phone interacts with you know the cloud and all these kind of. I just I think it's like it's just easy. It's to a know great other ecosystem. Do that, yeah. You and I talked about this on Sacred Plus that had already gone live. Where I was like, my theory of the case of why PlayStation Five is pretty much in a permanent place of dominance 
is because it's become an Apple like product where it just has mm. people that it's what you buy. Care. It doesn't they don't even care what anyone else is doing. They just aren't even looking, you know? Yeah. And I'm kind of like that with Apple where I don't have again, I've said it before. I have the shittiest watch, the shittiest phone. I don't care about any of that. I just know it's reliable and I've never had a problem like mm-hmm. and no, I'm, I get it. I get yeah. it. So that's yeah. that I would say I'm with definitely, them as well. uh, I'm definitely a huge Apple guy, too. It's funny you brought that up. It's everything I have watch, tablet, phone, all Apple. It's interesting, though, that what you're lauding it for is, which is totally accurate, which is the the dependability and how it just kind of works and ease of use and all that. And that's great. But what I always loved that has gone away was just the innovation. It was like Willy mm-hmm. Wonka, but for tech. I mean, almost every Apple reveal, even though you may not want it, it was like, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of the um, AR glasses they did, Jeffy? I yeah. love them, but I, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm that close, but I'm not going to do it. But I'm that yeah. close to dropping thirty five hundred bucks. Dude, I know people. I know, people, I know plenty of people at Apple, and you probably do too. I can get someone to buy it for you if you want, which would give you. I think they said they're giving twenty five or thirty percent off on it. Right? Oh, that's what, a lot. That to employees. I didn't think about that. I didn't know they had an employee discount. They um, I, well, I just read they definitely do because I bought things through friends before. But they, I, I read that the employee discount for this is significantly oh, higher. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I, I know yeah. it's going to be better next year, which is why it's kind of like when the first iPad came out, I got it because I was obsessed. I wanted it so badly. And I was like, oh, my God, I know in a year they're going to add a camera. And of course, they did. <laughs> and I'm like, I bought another one. So but yeah, no, I hear you. I, I'm excited for that. I really I, I believe in AR. Um, the shit AR I've done on MetaQuest 2 is still compelling. So I can't imagine how much better it's going to be on uh the, what is it? I vision I pro or whatever the fuck they're calling it. Yeah. The, the last thing I wanted to say, and we'll move out to the next topics are uh, the most pernicious form of brand loyalty, which is sports teams. Mm. And yeah, I'm, I can't, I still can't explain it. It's like a whole deep psychological dive that I'd like to do at some point with, with sports fans is like why this is the way it is, but just deep senses of loyalty to certain sports teams. Um, would be its own form of brand loyalty since they're not obviously these they're 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 massive profitable corporations some of the most profitable corporations in entertainment actually are sports or a lot of the sports teams most of the nfl teams are worth a mind-boggling amount of money and only increasing in size it's crazy uh walmart the walmart people bought the broncos for like 4.5 billion and then the the washington i was gonna say the redskins but the washington commanders went like two years later for six billion mm. So that the price is growing there. So yeah, probably the most pernicious form of brand loyalty in some sense that is unexplainable and is like classic consumerism, but none of us want to call it that. It's interesting. <laughs> well, I, I I read like I'm I'm obsessed with the NFL and I read is like our NFL fans like the biggest consumers of them all. And it's like, yeah, in some sense, I guess so. We sit there and watch all no matter what you put on, we'll just watch it. And if it's your team or football oh, in general. I'll watch any football any NFL game. Yeah. I do. I watch probably five or six full football games a, a week in the NFL because like the one o'clock, the four o'clock, the Sunday night, the Monday night, the Thursday night. And then sometimes there's like the random Saturday night games. It's just we perfectly like, paced throughout a day. Like you can you have these blocks throughout where it's like, OK, let me just dip out for a little bit, do X, Y, Z, come back with the games on again. It's just it's like an event, right? Um, totally. And when you go to them, like the tailgating and stuff. It's always definitely. And it's got a different you- vibe, too, on the different coasts where. On the East Coast, it's like you can get the if you like go to church or like you want to get some shopping done or go to brunch and then slide in for the games. But it kind of dominates the rest of your day. In the West Coast, football begins at 10 a.m., but it's over in time for you to have a night, which you mm-hmm. cannot have with football on the East Coast, which is <laughs> so it's totally different in that research. You were going to say something, Jaffe? I'm sorry. Well, I was just because, you know, I, I love watching football. I love watching uh, foot or all sports, but I love watching football when I have it on the DVR or the, uh, uh, what, what do we, uh, I don't know, the Hulu live TV or whatever, where it's recorded. So I can skip past everything except the plays. And I always wished, and I, I don't know if true football fans would, would like this or not, but I always wished it would be like golf where you could have four games going at a time. And it would be like, okay, game one, this is the play. It's done. Game two, here's the play. Game three, here's the play. We're back to game one. They're doing the second play. Because all that downtime, even though I know there's strategy happening and the commentary is interesting and all that, some of them, to me, it's just like, oh, but you fucking snap the ball and let's get rolling. But I mean, is that is that a rare 
take like as a guy who really understands and loves football like you do you go no 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 i like the whole you know pageantry around it and i like the 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 waiting between plays and waiting to you know the the instant replays and all that shit no i think there's too many commercials i mean the part of the game is like the play clock and manipulating the play clock so like you can't really mess with that which is why i bother right. like i've always said the worst thing about soccer is the timekeeping in soccer it makes no sense at all um, and people are like, well, why does the timekeeping make sense in the NFL? And I'm like, because it's totally manipulatable. Like there's rules about this is when the time runs. This is when it doesn't. This is how you can stop it. This is how you can let it run. You have to like do all of these kinds of things. So, you know, time management is a major part of playing football. But I think that all of the like you said, the pageantry and certainly the advertising around it has gotten gratuitous. And I think that that feedback has been received. The NFL has been experimenting this year with fourth quarters, not not all of them, but of select games have had fourth quarters with no commercial breaks to see oh, wow. see okay. how that goes because i i know football so well and i mute i mute commercials when they're on so i know it so well that like a play will happen like there'll be a punt the guy will you know have a fair catch and then i'll just mute the mute the channel because i know in 10 seconds they're going to kick at the commercial but really right. that commercial doesn't need to be there they punted the ball put 40 seconds on the play clock get get the offense on the field get the defense on the field and keep playing and i would love that's the great thing about soccer is that there's no way to interrupt the game like without there there are no commercial breaks you, you get the first half intermission with a bunch of commercials and commentary and then the second half and that's it. And pe- that's mm-hmm. what people complain about with football is that it's almost it wasn't made for TV, but it almost seems like it was. But that's based on it's being turn based and side based as opposed to this more fluid ever yeah. running thing. So. I, I went, you know, I I only I've been to one football game in my life live and it was USC and I wasn't into football at the time I was in college and I left after, you know, uh, the third inning. I know. I, 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 um, but, um, so, but then I got into football later and I, uh, it was, it was, uh, Auburn had had a great year and they were in the championships, which is hard to imagine. And they, I forget who they were playing, but I was at work and the only way I could watch the game was if you remember Xbox 360 at the time, they had something where they were broadcasting just the, the raw feed on Xbox 360. And so there was no commentary or commercials oh, wow. or anything flashy. And it would be like going to a football game. And I'm like, I hate this because it was, it really was like, there's nobody talking, yeah, it's you know, bad. except you know, it's just kind of like, you're left to your own understanding. Wrestling's the same way. If you watch WWE and then you go see it, they're totally different experiences. And some people might like them both, but I'd rather watch it on TV because mm-hmm. it's got all that stuff. But yeah, the commercials kill me though. I like fuck this shit. It's cool that they have they have been playing around. So like Amazon streams Thursday night football now, so they have all these modules that they've been playing around with, which are kind of neat. Like uh, multiple commentating teams, so like you can oh, get cool. like two different teams of commentators that would call the game. So one of them would be like the British commentators because the NFL is huge in Eng- in England and in Europe or whatever, and so you get a little bit of a different taste that way which I thought was neat. And something, I, I think this is a brilliant idea personally. Like I, I would, I think you could sell the, the NFL on this with Amazon and Thursday night football. And I'm surprised it hasn't come up is why can't you commentate over Thursday night football games on Twitch? Like, Oh, I know. You yeah, know, like, a, yeah. like NFL, like all Amazon prime NFL games on Thursday nights, you can stream them natively on Twitch since they're own, you know, Amazon owns them. And then you can just like dick around over the game and have fun with it and have your oh, chat in great. there to watch football and you commentate over it, you know, or all, all of that live shit. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy I, I that that's they want to make their money and I want them to make their money. But whether you're talking that or like the debates for politics or um, uh, the Oscars or any live event that generates people talking, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to rip people off. It's just that this is something I want to watch with other people that are like-minded and they, they really, I'm sure in five years it'll get solved, but you're absolutely yeah. right. Watching football with people and streaming it and talking about it would be, cause you imagine there's probably a whole generation of streamers that could really become, you know, the next big commentators for that generation because they really get you know, th- that generation and they can make football or baseball or whatever much more appealing than maybe a lot of people think it is. And those aren't the guys that are traveling with the team and, you know, the official commentators of the Lakers or whatever. So I think it's a great idea. I yeah. Think you should it, talk to them. Yeah. It's like, I like, 
I hope someone there knows that this is why I think that the division between sports and, and gaming and like even the fandoms of them are so confusing. It's like, dude, there's so many obvious, amazing ways to cross over. I've been saying that a lot with the upcoming NCAA football game, which I, I was telling our audience on Sacred Symbols, a lot of them don't watch sports. I'm like, you have no clue how big this game is going to be with the NIL, with the uh, NIL stuff all taken care of and these guys making yeah, yeah. money now. It's going to be on every one wait. of these guys fucking feeds on their IGs on on Snapchat everywhere. It's going to be everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. So yeah, the crossover there is, is fairly obvious, but um, anyway, shout out to sports and uh, the domination that they have over my life. And, and we're recording this today before the divisional round of the NFL playoffs and really excited to get into those games. We'll see how they go. All right, Dave, let's get into our third topic this week. We go to you. All right. Sounds good. You three legends today. I want to talk to you guys about legends. And what I mean by this is something, you know, that applies to your adult life or something from childhood just a person, incident, a story, a place, you know, a legend that touched your life in some way. Maybe it's funny. Maybe it's deep. Maybe you got to the bottom of it at some point. It's, it's no longer a mystery. Maybe it's still a legend that's at large. But I think about this one a lot because something happened to me, and this is what I really want to tell you guys about. It's a run-in that I had with a legend in my life that I finally got to meet and work with um, probably a little over a year ago, not quite a year and a half ago. But I'll start by telling you guys a childhood legend that I think is fun that I just researched to see if I was up to speed on and I found out a little more about this. Colin will know a little bit about this, but growing up on Long Island, there was a lake eh, pretty far out east, center island, but a little, a little eastward called Lake Ronkonkoma. And we didn't live near it, but we were kind of like in a neighboring school district, a few towns away. And the rumor was always that it was a bottomless lake. This lake had no bottom, which was Mm. always something that just captured my imagination. And then because it was a quote unquote bottomless lake, who knew what was living in there? And then you would hear tales of like Loch Ness monster related adjacent stories and stuff like that. And it always kind of freaked me out a little bit as a kid because I know the older people that grew up on Long Island had some sort of, I don't know what you call it, like a voodoo or a, a, a they, they would, they were afraid of the lake. Like it, the, their whole thing was we don't go swimming in that lake. And it was the type of lake that people went boating on. It had like white sand beaches. So people would swim. There were lifeguards But the whole thing for the older set was like, we don't go in that lake. And apparently, I didn't know about this. Kyle, I don't know if you knew about this. There was a story dating back centuries that is very Pocahontas-like, where there was supposedly a Native American princess, I forget her name, but she had some sort of, she was smitten with some random Caucasian dude. Now, this is in the 1600s, okay? And again, this kind of plays out like Pocahontas and John Smith, but it was the Long Island version of that, I guess. And she kind of loved this guy from afar and would write little love notes on tree bark, float them across the lake to his camp. I don't know if he was a logger or a fur trapper. I don't know what he did. And did this supposedly for years on end. And never received an answer from this guy. So heartbroken, one day, she canoed out into the center of the lake, stabbed herself in the heart, drowned, and that was the end of that story. Unrequited love, right? But supposedly, at least one person would die in the lake every year from that point on. Hundreds of people have have drowned in, in Lake Ronkonkoma. And story goes that only two of them we're, we're women. So it's always men. It's always at least one a year. And supposedly the story is that this unhappy, heartbroken Native American princess is taking the lives of men because that's, you know, that's the whole bit. And I, I thought that was a really cool story. But the whole thing is, you know, it, as it played out and over the years, supposedly the lake is very deep. It's 90 feet deep, but it does have a bottom. I hate to spoil it for you guys. That you know, it's it's not even a huge lake. Like if you look at one of the Great Lakes, what's it called again? It's called Lake Ronkonkoma. Lake Ronkonkoma. I have a piece up here actually. The Indians' name. I'll put it here in the chat. 
the Indian's name, the woman's name is, I just had it, Tuscawana, I think. Yes, that's right. Take that. Yeah, Tuscawanta. Tuscawanta. Yeah. So kind of a kind of a cool little story and a kind of a little legend from from growing up. I, I kind of there was always the little haunted house legends and all these things growing up, but I think that was always a cool one because you know I even as a teenager it was like is that I don't understand is that lake bottomless and the whole thing the whole sort of superstition around you can't swim in that lake. One hundred and sixty six men have died on the lake. So according to this. Lots of men. Lots yeah, of men. And barely any women. Mysterious. Hmm. Right? So hmm. pretty pretty neat. But really what I wanted, I wanted to set the stage. Maybe you guys have a cool childhood legend like that. But I wanted to tell you guys about something that happened to me. This would be kind of cathartic because I don't think I've ever told anybody about this. And it was kind of, it was a little bit traumatized. I played, it, it has a happy ending. But it was traumatic. So there's this guy. I won't tell him. I won't say what his name is. But he's an slightly older than me, maybe the generation of animator before me, right? Five, 10 years tops older than me. And I always knew about him because he was always floating around New York. He was one of the big heavies. He was one of the animation directors on the East Coast. And I never crossed paths with him. I just never, I always knew he was affiliated with a certain studio, especially, but I just never worked with him. And when I got to this studio a couple of years ago, I knew he was kind of the top of the heap. Like he was the overarch. He was the chief creative in charge of everything, but he was so high up that I knew he wasn't directly related to the project I was working on. But I did have the understanding that he would be at least overseeing things from afar. Like he had final cut. He has final say on all the designs, but I didn't know how involved he would make himself on the thing I was working on. So I knew he was there, but I didn't. I thought my lim- I would have very limited interaction with this guy. But it was interesting that he was there. I had always heard about him. He had a reputation for being quite a taskmaster. Didn't suffer fools. One of those dudes. So I get to the studio, doing the project, kind of on as a lead designer slash art director. So I'll have a team of 2D and 3D animators. Small team. Eight people, maybe. My producer, head writer, all that kind of thing. First week's going pretty swimmingly. It's going off without a hitch. Get like midway through the week. We have our first big design meeting for the project. And I find out that this guy is going to be in the meeting. I, and I, I, no one even tells me. I just see his name on the people invited to the Zoom call. So I'm like, oh shit, I'm going to get to meet this guy for the first time. Even though it's afar, we're not, you know, we're not in the same office, but... I'm going to have the, I'm going to, it's going to, it's going to happen. I'm going to meet this dude. So he comes into the meeting and we're talking about, I think, character design at that point. We're sort of in the very early offing of the project, just starting to get our feet wet, thumbnail sketches, visual exploration, all that kind of thing. And he just kind of, I think my producer was talking and he was just like, hold on, hold on. I don't understand. I need, the art director, he didn't even call me by name. He was like, I need the art director to share his screen and show me what you're talking about. And so I was like, all right. So I'm starting to get a little flustered, heart rate increasing. I'm like, oh shit, this guy wants me to draw for the entire group. And he's like, Dagan, can you, you know, do you have Photoshop or whatever pulled up? Like, can you, can you draw what you're talking about? And he's acting very, he's, there's no, there's no sympathy in his voice. There's no empathy in his voice. He's like, he's telling me like, I need you to do what I'm asking right now. That's the tone I'm getting. And I'm like, oh shit. Now I understand what's going on here. Get on, share the screen. I'm drawing. I see his, you know, I'm looking at him, his little, you know, his little box. I'm looking at his facial expression. And as I'm drawing, he's just telling me, no, I I need to see this. No, I need to see that. And I'm trying to understand what he wants. He's being very short. You know, he's obviously getting annoyed. And I'm just kind of trying to invoke this. All right, dude, like, stay calm. Don't let him see you sweat. Don't get flustered. Just kind of keep your eye on the prize. You know, that type of thing. And this went on for probably, it felt like an eternity, but it was the better part of an hour where 
I was literally drawing things from scratch on the screen. And then I was drawing front views of characters and he was getting so impatient that I was like, how do I make this more efficient? I would draw a half of a face, cut it and mirror it. So I could just put the two together because I'm just drawing the front view of a character. So I could, I could kind of mosaic it together. I'm trying to think of everything to just keep this guy from losing his shit. You know what I mean? Because he, I think he was unhappy with the direction of the design and he wanted to work it out then and now. And I'm trying to accommodate him, but he's talking and I'm drawing. So it's hard to keep up. So I'm thinking of every way. How am I going to, you know, how am I going to do this? And after a while, I was just, it just dawned on me. I was like, this guy is testing me. This guy is completely testing me. Like it, it seemed everything he was asking. And the speed at which he was asking and making these requests seemed completely unreasonable. And then I realized this guy is vetting me. And the thing is, this guy is doing it in front, not only vetting my drawing ability, but he's seeing if I can remain cool in front of the group. And I got out of the meeting and I wasn't sure, you know, I I was kind of turned around at that point. You know, it was the better part of an hour trying to appease this guy. I could see the rest of the group my producer, my fellow animators, designers, or everybody looks a little concerned. They all know him a little bit. You know, keep that in mind too. I'm, I'm coming in fresh. I don't know. I never interacted with this man before. Get off the call. We're on Slack, which is like, for those of you who don't know, it's like an inner office messaging file sharing app that is widely used in the animation industry. Anyway, I'm not sure how it is a gaming jappy, but a friend of mine who I, you know, I just met was like, dude, um, you know, he he literally slacked me. He messaged me and he was like, dude, I'm so sorry. Like that guy could just take the air out of a room. Like that's his MO. And, but I realized this guy, I was the newbie and this guy was going to give me my run, the run for my money. And he was, he was testing me to see if I was up to the task. And you know what? He, from that moment on, I would say from the following week, I got the sense that this guy was taking me under his wing. So it was like, it was really cool, but he was doing something that you hear about, or I feel like you would only see in like Mad Men, where somebody is actually, somebody, he, I was actually being tested. And for for me, for my personality, I would never do that to somebody. I'm much too considerate for that. But that's exactly what it was. And that was kind of my brush with this legendary dude. And you know what? I appreciate that. I We went on to become fast friends. It was definitely, you know, I'm old enough now where it's like, I'm the mentor, you know. Um, Jaffe, you could speak to that. You know, at our, at our age, we're not we're not really taken under the wing so much as we're taking people under our wing. So I thought it was really cool at 40, whatever I was at that time, 48 years old, that this guy was taking me under his wing and he really did. And I, I know from that interaction that I made him happy enough that he could rely on me for things because he was the guy who had the final say on all the creative division, you know, all the creative decisions for all the projects. So he could lean on me if we had an overseas studio in India animating something, he could say, Dagan, can you just thumbnail these storyboards? Like this sequence isn't working. The continuity is all fucked up. Can you jump in there and just kind of blue line for them? So I became like, <laughs> it sounds terrible to say it this way. I became like an appendage for him to say, all right, like I can't, I only have two hands. Like, let me use Dagan to, you know, um, be the client facing guy this week or deal with the, you know, a group of designers that I don't have time to talk to because I'm in meetings or whatever. And this guy was bi-coastal. He was flying back and forth from LA to New York. So he was busy, but you know, it turned out good again, happy ending, but it was my brush with a dude that I knew had a reputation for doing this sort of thing. And then it happened to me type of thing, which was- Did you ever um, ask him after you became friends? Is that what you were doing? He doesn't have, that's the thing, Jaffe. Like if it was somebody who I was more approachable, Someone who, who's more like my personality, maybe you feel like a modicum of warmth, you know, that type of thing. He's very, he's got a very prickly personality. I knew mm. after that, that I earned his trust and that he grew to like me, but it wasn't that type of thing where I still don't feel comfortable. I'm like, dude, what were you, you know, it would have been awesome if I could be, dude, what were you doing to me? You almost gave me a heart attack type right. of thing. 
And also putting me on the spot you. in front of people I'll was really in 20 something years, I had never been tested like that. And this guy was just like, you know, I don't know if he knew my experience. I don't know if he knew my pedigree. I don't know if he gave a shit, but he was just, you know, it was, he was making it very clear that he was the cock of the walk. Right. And I was on his turf and you have to play up to my. Do standards. you have his phone number? Yeah. <laughs> if you give yeah. it to me, he'll never know number. it's coming from you. I can call him and ask him if he does that. <laughs> I would do it too. We could do it on this show. Give it to me right now. I'll do it. He's, you know what happened though with him? And I hope look, he look, doesn't hear dodge, this and take this the dodge, wrong way. Dodge. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> he got laid off last year. And I thought that. I thought that was odd because he was really at the top of the food chain creatively. But then what happened was I just thought that he was the king domino and the whole team fell, but quickly found out that the entire team was intact. Only he was let go. What was so I don't know if, I don't know if somebody like him, I don't, I think it's, there's, it's way too PC, if you will now mm-hmm. to operate like that in the world we live in now. I think people are going to take... People are going to complain. You know what I mean? I'm Gen X too. Like, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but I understand we've been through it. We've kind of, the workplace has evolved in the last three decades, but we're not going to, there's not going to be a lot of Gen Xers that complain about that sort of thing. Let's be honest. We weren't, we weren't raised in that sensitive environment. No, And I also think there is an appreciation for leadership has to be, you know, it, it doesn't have to be abusive. It doesn't have to be cruel, but right. people who find themselves in leadership, especially creative leadership positions, tend to be a little, they, you know, they, they're a little outsidery. They don't, you know, um, they just, that's, you know, it kind of comes with the territory. And yeah. so I'm curious because I do think a kinder, nicer workplace is super important. And I don't want to sort of perpetuate the romanticized view that, creativity has to come from crazy artists and all this bullshit. But at the same time though, I'm curious as that does get weeded out of the workplace, uh, are you going to see less interesting content? Because you know, you only create interesting shit cause you're broken. Once you're healthy, you don't need to do it anymore. No, that's true. Broken yeah. and hungry. I would, I yeah. would argue. Jaffe, right? I, absolutely. And that's that drove me for the longest time. And then once I got enough money to not be hungry and enough therapy to not be, well, I was still broken, but I w- was okay with it. I was like, oh, I like being broken. Um, I lost a lot of interest in creating that kind of content. That's I'm like, I did it. I, I don't need to do it anymore. That is so, really interesting. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that trial by fire, like the generation – probably under me, like let's say Colin's age now that are becoming the officers in the mm-hmm. army, like they're they're growing in the ranks. Like I think that trial by fire mentality, that's not going to be a personality type anymore. And at least in animation, I don't know how it is in the, in other industries and other creative. Well, I think know. it's, I think it's going to be prevalent as long as they keep making the money. That's, that's, the, that's the only difference is that the minute you like, I'm be curious if this guy got laid off and you can almost trace it to, oh, well, yeah, because the last thing that team did was a big failure. Mm. And then it's kind of like you only put up with the pain in the asses as long as they're worth it. And then once they stop being worth it, it's like, get the fuck out of here. You're that's a pain a great in the point. ass. Right. Um, as long as he's getting results. Right. If that's his, ta- if that's his tactic, is that his, his ruling philosophy? As yeah. long as we're getting, yeah, that's a, that's another Do you know if the point. show he was working on when he got laid off was a dud? It was the same stuff. It was just, it was, and he was, he was sort of in charge of the higher end quality driven stuff, not mm-hmm. just the shovely stuff. And he was also in charge of the higher end outsourcing teams. So like the gotcha. animation studios that were more expensive and more quality driven, he was sort of in charge of that. I, I think the stuff that really made the company shine and then other yeah. people were in charge of the B team. You know, the, the most interesting thing that time has given me when it comes to this topic of, of, or in this specific guy you're talking about is like, you survive long enough that you see, you have the experience of at least a handful of cycles where that guy or that girl, usually that guy for whatever that's worth is ruling the roost. 
And your first experience with that is that must be amazing. And that guy is the guy to get to know. And that guy has got the power. And then suddenly something will happen. They'll get fired. They'll quit. Um, they'll die. Uh, you know, and, and the worm turns and you have that perspective and appreciation of the fact that that guy was in that position for no, or, or looked at that way for no reason other than what he could do for the powers that be, because they will slot in another guy. Like I remember seeing at Sony, it was like, Oh, there's, uh, uh, Kelly flock and then Phil Harrison and then Shuhei. And then I remember, I remember being at E3 once and seeing Sean Layden, uh, walking off in the distance. He didn't see me. He was like on the other side of the uh, area we were in and he was just followed, you know, PR was with him and marketing was with him and, you know, people who wanted his ear were with him and it was like, he couldn't get a break. And I was like going, that must be really interesting and cool. And then I remember when he was ushered out very rudely and, you know, it reminds me on that scene in the West wing when the guy who ran for president, Alan Alda lost. And then a few days later, a week's later, he goes into a Starbucks to get a coffee and the, the lady behind the counter didn't even know who he is. He's like, she's like, what's your name again? And he's like, oh, it's Arnie. And she's like, Avi, what? You know, it, it it's, it's just fascinating to watch that, you know, because when you see it, you go, A, it's not permanent, and B, it's not personal, and C, it's not real. All that magic those people have that are, oh, they're in charge. They're the ones they know it can be taken away, it can be given. It's fascinating to watch. That's a great um, it's a great that's a that's a really great point. And you know, yeah. he was such he was so so different than my other mentors. The other two or three guys that I've they were all got to happen to me, men that brought me along in the industry were much more kindly and much more demonstrative with their affection and their praise. Like he was really a tough love dude. He was like the yeah. first mentor I had that was like, I gotta really work to please this guy. So it was right. good for me. It was good for my talent, it was good for my I felt like it was good for my station, like it might be good for me to evolve into a higher place. Um, yeah. But you know, yeah, the fact that he, th th what you said, like the fact that he was let go, it just the whole thing just dissipated. Yeah. And that power, yeah, it's, it's, te it's temporary. I mean, think, about, it's, yeah, think about being Jim Ryan or think about being like, or, or Sean, it's like your day, one day, everybody's calling, everybody's sending you gifts at Christmas. I used to have that where my office would get filled with Christmas gifts uh, from the industry. Um, you know, everybody wants to know your take and all that. And then the next day you're just some guy walking around mm. and it's not that Sean wasn't just some guy walking around ever. It's just that it's a, it's a real shift. Um, and I think it's a fascinating one and it's, it's an important one to think about if you live in those worlds, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well, Sorry, I was muted. Excelling to the height of power uh, and then having it taken away is always interesting. That's why I always think about when presidents leave office. Yeah. Is that's probably incredibly difficult to do is not to relinquish power, but to just not be in power anymore, to, to just suddenly be the ex-president. And yeah, yeah, like no one gives a shit. And in fact, there's a lot of animosity towards you anyway, probably, and you're going to be shoved out both by your opponents and by your own party who wants to move on from you and all of that. So I always think about that. And yeah, so CEOs and just rising to the top and then crumbling back. And you're not really, none of these people are crumbling. They're all rich right. and right and, and well off. Um, Dig, I'll leave it back to you though. Who do you want to kick it over to? For yeah, Matt, I mean, Maddie, we haven't heard from you in a while. Just legends, sure. however you want to take it, childhood, adult. Yeah, there was one that immediately came to mind for me. It's really the only one I think I know of. Um, I, I remember when I was in pff, 2006 or seven or eight, it's in that range. Um, I remember like on the news was onion town, which wasn't really far from where I lived. I feel like I've talked about it before here on the show. If I haven't, then yeah, briefly, I think, yeah, it's like that was, yeah, not too far off. And I remember that was like a really big deal. Like I remember in school, people talking about like how it, it's this like, place you can't go near and there's this video for those who don't know that was going viral a bunch of teenagers dro drove through onion town which again for those who don't know is this like unpaved road that ends at a, a dead end it's a very like impoverished community of people and um, when they drove through they were yelling stuff out the window is what has been reported now all these years later like there's still like investigations ongoing and just people trying to figure out what happened there um but they drove through and like they were throwing bricks at them and like anyone who trespassed was getting attacked apparently. 
And it's interesting because there's such a small, tight knit community that like if you go and look at videos of people talking about Onion Town even to this day, there are people like in the comments section discussing their time as part of like the Onion Town community. They're like, yeah, like we just kind of moved on. Like we don't we're not like that anymore. <laughs> like it's it's really interesting. But growing up, this was like not only such a big deal because it was like it's spitting distance, but it was also like so crazy that this kind of urban legend was right in your not urban legend, but this 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 legendary thing was like right in my backyard. And um, yeah, like I remember just seeing it on the news and stuff and it was crazy, but it was also kind of scary. It was like, you know, like we're, we're in a modernized society. Like, why are people behaving this way? And you learn like there are reports from Vice, U.S. Sun. Like I was going through it a bit earlier of, you know, people who go to Onion Town. They're like, yeah, I drove through Onion Town. There's a report from last year. They're like, I drove through Onion Town. I waved to people. They said hi back. Really friendly. Um, they're just very to themselves. Um, in fact, I learned what's interesting is like people there struggle to get jobs. Post office doesn't deliver mail there. Oh, wow. So it's still like I, I've even read like comments from people uh, who who like like town councilors and whatnot, like people who like would associate themselves closely with Onion Town. And there was like, yeah, they're to them. They keep to themselves. They do their thing. We kind of just let them do that. And so things could still be going on there. Uh, who knows? But it's interesting to see how like they were very much mischaracterized clearly because they were instigated and responded to like a bunch of teenagers pranking them. And then they've all these years later, they're still like I was looking up. There's people on Reddit like, hey, whatever happened on you in town? Like, is it still kind of freaky? Like there were there were rumors like the amount of rumors that spiraled out of that one video, like they're inbreeds, like that, that type of stuff. It's incredible what's come out of it. But yeah, that was like the main thing as a kid growing up where it was like you can go anywhere. But don't go to Onion Town. It's like, okay, got it. If I get when I get my license, I won't go. Um, and this guy was gonna how fucking go to Onion Town to begin with. Like that was on my dance cart. Yeah, that was that was yeah. something that I was considering. Right? That was yeah. in the play. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. I, I'm curious if you guys have heard of Onion Town at yeah. all. Is it something you're familiar with? Yeah, I was just I remember you bringing this up because I was I brought it up here on Wikipedia. Onion Town is a road and community in Dutchess County, New York located one and a half miles south of the hamlet of Dover Plains, partially known for the historically off-putting demeanor of its residents towards <laughs> outsiders. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like I don't remember the context, but I knew it through you. I had never heard of it before that. And I, I'm reading here. It was on national television. Right. It, yeah, there's yeah. a New York Daily News article here from July 4th, 2008. Um, and uh, it, so the, the YouTube video, I think, is from 2008. And there's also a Vice like re video on it. As That's well. what I saw. I thought the draw or the novelty, I didn't know it was their attitude initially. I thought it was the fact of like, can you believe this, this hick town still doesn't have paved roads? Like I thought it was like the hillbilly angle, but I think that was really the angle is that people there were just very, very inhospitable. Like don't come to Onion Town because they were probably so tired of like, you know, people coming through, you know, Truly. rubbernecking and all totally. of that. And if they just paved the road, that probably would have been enough. Yeah, you right. Know? That, that, that's that also, they done. also have like, from what I saw on images, like don't trespass, like don't please stop here signs. I, I don't know how old those are. So it's just, yeah, it's interesting. That it's still kind of like ongoing. Like it's, you know, they're probably good folk there. But you probably don't want to go there just in case they're not there. <laughs> you the never know. The people of Onion Town. Yeah. The good people of Onion Town. <laughs> yeah, that's the only legend that I, I know of though. They smell it. of onions because they are onions. Yeah, I mean, that's just an unfortunate that's name, the too. It really is. I mean, Onion Town, really? <laughs> what? I kind of dig it. Yeah, I dig I it love now. Onions. It sounds like gotta... something you'd see in like a fantasy RPG or something. Oh, like, totally. Oh, yeah. We're going to go north a couple clicks to Onion Town. Yeah. I'm so going to talk to the mayor of Onion Town. Town down there. You can get yourself uh, some gold <laughs> and a pickaxe and start your uh, mining career. And yeah, beware of the monsters in Onion Town, though. There could be a whole goddamn. Uh, sh like, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We should go. <laughs> I think mind, we should Jeff. go make an LSM outing to Onion Town. <laughs> you, guys, get, you guys should do your next live killed. LSM live in Onion Town. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to be on a truck because you got to keep moving or they'll fucking kill you. So it's just like. I wonder how they'd respond to that, Colin. I love that. Not well. <laughs> It'll be like the the gathering of the juggalos because we'd have to do it outside, like in the middle of what, nowhere, basically. In what Onion Town. city is this in? Onion Town. It's Onion Town, New York, in upstate uh, New York, the hamlet okay. of Dover Plains, in the town of Dover, New York. Anybody want to take bets on what they what they uh, voted in the last election? 
<laughs> just <laughs> upstate New York, I wonder. Yeah, we may um, be surprised. Dig, you know what came to mind for me with this was uh, nothing specific, but just I wonder if people, if it's common to grow up in a place as haunted or supernaturalistic as Long Island is looked at by the people that live there. So well, there's a lot of weird shit on Long Island and and also in the water off of Long Island. And it truly is weird shit that. So the biggest thing on Long Island that's strange is Brookhaven National Laboratory, where an enormous number of complex experiments have been known or thought to be, you know, like looked into there and a lot of like weird supernatural space time, interdimensional weird shit. And it's surrounded by woods and like armed guards and fences. Isn't that what and, Stranger Things, that section of Stranger Things is based on? Where they yeah, that? it seems like it. I would, that's what my assumption was when I watched it. Yeah, is that it's based oh, on yeah, that. Okay, and our funny. friends like, well, I can't speak for Dagan, but I had friends whose parents worked there. Mm. You didn't really know like what they did or whatever, but there was always that vibe, like that Philadelphia experiment style. What yeah. the fuck's going on there vibe. And that was really we are from Brookhaven. That's where the town we're called is from Brookhaven. So Brookhaven National Lab is right is right near us. And so I always think of that and I think of Camp Hero. So uh, at the end of Long Island, there is like this uh, this abandoned installation, like military installation and Plum Island, Plum Island, which, which you're not allowed to go to. And it's like an animal research island with like weird experiments going on there. And and then all the and then, of course, all the stuff everyone knows about, like Amityville and all the shit in like old, uh, like in Nassau County with uh, all the old graves and all the Indian legends and history there. I just I felt growing up on Long Island had an ear like an inherent eeriness to it. Yeah, that I think about. So there's like all sorts of weird shit surrounding all of those things. And then. Two other ones, Dig, that I thought I would throw in there. Funny, funnier ones. You'll remember one of these legend, legendary character in my life. I know who you're going to say. I'm so you excited. Do, are you? Do you know? I Rockman, know. Rockman Jackson. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> there was this kid I grew up with named Rockman Jackson. All right. And he was this uh, curly haired kid. I think he was Hispanic or like maybe Hispanic and black or something. Um, and he was my friend in elementary school and he was known in elementary school as being the fastest kid like that you've ever seen, like unbelievably fast. And what was so funny about this and why Dagan's so excited about it is that his best friend PJ <clears throat> gleamed onto this to this day, asked me about Rockman Jackson. <laughs> this probably literally comes from like 1991 or something. Yeah, I see. And he was like this legendary figure. I I don't know what happened to him. I never saw him again because after that year, I moved to New England for five years and lived with my mom. And then I moved when I moved back to Long Island for high school, Rockman Jackson was nowhere to be found. Like he was out. So really? I, so, yeah. So I had a so Rockman Jackson is like a figment of my imagination. And one of the things I remember about him is that I went to his birthday party and bought him G.I. Joe's and he was like really amped about it. It was at his house in like Medford or whatever. But I don't know what happened to him. So Rockman Jackson was like this legendary figure. And, and PJ used to be like, oh, you faster than Rockman Jackson? And that's like shit. Dude, he used to, he, I'm he used looking to, him up. I'm his trying name to was find Rockman him. Jackson. First of all, there's no, there's never going to be a cooler name than that. No. That's the best name ever. And yeah, I want to say like his mom was Hispanic and his dad was black or something like that. So if you find, if you see any pictures out there, maybe that would, that would help you narrow it down. But um, you may have told us, Kyle, yeah. that when he ran at top speed, he left trails, fire trails like the DeLorean. <laughs> that might have been part of the lore. Yeah, the lore, the legend. <laughs> he was so fast. I remember him being so fast. That the then, soles of his feet were like blackened. Of his sneakers were like, you know, like molten. And then, Dig, I got to bring this up. This is, this is X-rated. Mm-hmm. But we bring this up once in a while. Is the legend does ever... I think Micah even has a legend similar to this in her high school or in her school district. The girl who like lost a hot dog in her vagina. We were just talking about this yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Like, does every school have this legend? I know it I've comes up every so that. often, like where it's like, oh, that that girl went to the on the ski trip and and got a like a hot dog s- stuck in her vagina or something. And then it's like, dude, you had that that rumor too. It's like one of those weird universe. Like who started that? Jaffe, did, did this- you have this in that down and well, Alabama? I, here's what I up? have written down on my notes. Um cat food because ours was a girl who 
would go home and put cat food on her body and let the cat lick it off. Oh, okay. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and she, you know, and I know her name to this day and I know that traveled with her for a very long time and I don't know how she ever dealt with it, but, um, we didn't get the hot dog story or at least I didn't hear it. Uh, but the cat food story was pretty popular. That's so sad. So it was a specific person. Cause for me, yeah, or oh, someone yeah. you knew, cause for me, it was like, Oh, my older brother's friend or whatever, you know, it would always be some distant thing you couldn't verify. Oh no, yeah. you would, yeah. you know, I, I have to assume that she would, you know, you'd be sitting in class and just to be a dick, you'd be like, you smell fancy feast. I smell That's fancy so feast. sad. Why did that's you guys so do, this story? I do, that. I didn't do that? But people, you know, people, that's what they said. I don't fucking know. Maybe that turned some people on, but that was the one that we heard. But why was it that, what did, what was it? Was she just an easy target or was she, there something wrong she with her? She was beautiful. Or? Actually, she was uh, mm. not one of the most popular girls, but she wasn't picked on. She was just kind of this, you know, you didn't really think about her other than like, she's very exotic and, and, and beautiful looking girl. Um, oh, wow. I don't know why. Um, it wasn't like she was the girl that a lot of people picked on or anything like that. It was just, you know, m maybe she was so gorgeous that a lot of people were intimidated and needed to come up with some kind of, I, I have no clue, but that, that permeated Mountain Brook high school and junior high for a very Man. long time. That, that reminds and you me can of best, reach her on OnlyFans uh, for just a donation of cat food <laughs> and a donation of the SPCA oh, no. or whatever it's called. Yeah. Oh no. Go ahead, Maddie. I'm oh, sorry. It, no, it, it reminds me of um, I had a, a best friend growing up in middle school into high, and it carried with him into high school. Where on the bus, I don't know where this fucking came from. They just said he had crabs, and and like they just stuck with it. Like all the girls, like ew, you have crabs. Like this guy just <laughs> like no, I don't. Like he's I don't have itchy nuts. Like come on now, and it carried into fucking his like freshman year of high school. They're like, yeah, that's the kid who's got crabs. Like just fucking ruining this dude's entry into high school. Uh, I felt so bad for him. Eventually it, it, it faded off, but um, that was, I, I say that because I wonder Jaffe was just brought up just to be mean spirited, which sometimes can be mm. hilarious when we're at that age. It, it probably Definitely. starts there, but then it just becomes compelling enough of a story that it's not even about being mean. It's just like, because it takes know, on a narrative of its own. Now, now what do we add on top of this? Yeah. Got I mean, crabs. Now what? At least she's getting licked on the regular. I mean, a lot of yeah. these other girls were probably Someone's just, getting some action around here. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's from <laughs> Morris the cat, but hey, you know. <laughs> well, Kyle, you know what it was? And I think you and I figured this out at some point. Mm. And I was just, it's so funny that you mentioned this because I was just talking to this with Helene last night. And she grew up in the suburbs of Philly and it was the same thing. She had one of those stories. In fact, she knew the girl, the girl lived on her cul-de-sac. And it was always, I don't want to say always, but probably once or twice in junior high and once or twice in high school, you would hear the hot dog slash frozen hot dog stuck in the vagina. And the, the part of the, the story was the kid had to go to Florida to get it removed. What? <laughs> that was always a story. I can't, you can't write this stuff. But what it was, well, you know what it was? The girl pregnancy. got pregnant. Yeah. And had With to go. Dog. Everybody had family in Florida. We grew up on Long Island. You yeah, like you send aunt. them the way to be pregnant and they come back and they're not. You know, exactly. Yeah. Avoid the embarrassment. That's what it was. I don't know how that translates to the hot dog story. I'm sure that was passed down from, I'm sure that started in the 60s, right? Where it was just like every generation had, I could tell you the girl it was when I was in eighth grade. You know, so that's what it was. It was always that fact that they had to go down, stay with the aunt, uncle, or grandma in Tampa, Orlando, wherever they were, and take, get it taken care of. The family avoids the embarrassment, the stigma. They come back. And then, but yeah, I mean, I figured that out in my 30s. I was like, but oh the my kids God. thought she was going to Florida to have the hot dog removed. <laughs> that's the bastardization of the of the whole thing yeah at some point maybe it's just, fed too by her dude, you can get maybe it done so anywhere but either onion town or florida is the best place to get a hot dog removed from her <laughs> vagina and she's closer to florida so that's where she went i mean that, it could be dog. something as simple as like as being sent off and having an abortion and then kind of sitting it out and coming back and having nothing to really in quote unquote show for it so then Maybe that's where the maybe feeding some weird perverse thing that she had to go do as she disappeared for a semester or whatever, and then comes back. Maybe that is just the the source of the explanation. You know? Yeah, I, I don't know. Things. It's Alexa, interesting. Like, I always think of order hot dogs. 
<laughs> I always think of the term 420 where uh, that term just, if you read about it, like just kind of spread to mean a certain thing, but it comes from a very specific, what they think are a very specific place and time. And it kind of just spread around for no reason, really, until you just said it without knowing why. And it's kind of like the vagina hot dog story. In that sense, you have no idea what the provenance of that is. It'll be awesome to know. We should have serious people looking at this, but they won't. There's a documentary. There's a whole documentary you can make on that. Or just the, 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 not even just, you can have like six, cover six of them. Because there's got to be like a, 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 an Avengers of, of sexualized high school stories that go around. Totally. You could just do a series on Netflix of each episode is the hot dog, the cat food. I would watch the shit out of that fucking thing. (laughs) God, I'm good. These ideas just come to me. It's like a gift. I think you got something. Oh, yeah, I got something already. Right. You got something there. Yeah, Dig, are you uh, uh, are you satiated? Yeah, if everybody feels oh, hey, like hey, uh, I didn't get to do oh, oh, Jeff, oh, sorry, yeah, Jeff, you yeah, didn't get to go. Look, look, well, yeah, go I, I actually, I, I had a serious question uh, first because I mean, Dagan, at this point, your kids are probably the youngest compared to mine. I know you guys don't have kids yet, um, but. I, I wonder, are some of these legends, not the hot dog stuff, that that kind of stuff obviously will be around, you know, forever. But things like the lake or things like, um, you know, the haunted stuff or, or I, I, I just I wonder, does that still permeate junior high, high school today? Or is it a different world where these kids are worried about shootings and terrorism and war and it's like it's it almost seems like it's a charming relic of a past where you had nothing to worry about so you invented Mm -hmm. it but do your kids have these myths that are still viable you know why i don't think so and i'll tell you why i think that because they're growing up in the same area the same school district where helene went to school and yeah. she definitely, when I, I met her, we were in our early twenties. Like she had all those stories about local, you know, it's it's suburban Philadelphia. It's all colonial. It's one of the oldest places in the country. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, um, so they had all the haunted churches. There was a hill that supposedly a little hill, like a town from here, like near the kids' high school, yeah. that supposedly if you park there at night the car would go by itself. The kids never talk about that stuff. They don't even know about it. What do you think the reason is? I think it's because the internet just dispelled all that magic. Nothing's mm. incredible anymore. Everything, not, there's nothing that would surprise yeah. them. Right. You know what I mean? They're, and and they're not even interested. They're just so, not just my kids, but you know, sadly kids in general, they're just, they're just so plugged in. Nothing's yeah. analog anymore. No one just wants to tell stories yeah. around the you know the, now they case. go to youtube and watch what, what's that guy's name uh, i don't know if he's still even popular chills do you know the chills youtuber no mm. he's got this crazy voice that's just like i mean he's the guy who's like burger king foot lettuce number 11 and he just talks like that and he makes tons of money and he just does monotone urban legends but he does big fucking numbers you never I even see his shit. face he just talks like this <laughs> um no, the only two that come to mind for me uh and both are personal because you know i don't have any ghost stories or anything from alabama but one was uh it reminds me when you're going about the guy with crabs right so there was a girl <laughs> i liked in junior high her name was angela she played saxophone in the band uh and there was another guy named jim who liked her too and one day it came down to me from, I don't know, information from friends, I suppose, that, oh, well, Angela doesn't like you because you're gay. And I said, but I'm not gay. And they said, we know, but Jim said you were. That way you don't have, he didn't have to compete with you. But I totally took care of that because I fucked his mother. And then it was clear I wasn't gay. And then it was an open playing field again. The <laughs> other one, um, that's all true except the mother part. Oh. She, she, she was too expensive. She was too expensive. I couldn't afford it. Um, the other one, though, seriously, this happened. Look at Maddie. So I don't. I don't even know. Maddie's like, I hate this guy. I. I would love the people. Dude, I laughed. But I know, but because it's so. Res- no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not insulting you. I'm saying it's like because you're so reserved that I can't get a read on you, and I can. I can get a read on Colin. I have a foul mouth. You're. You're clear. The joke passed. Okay. <laughs> good. The other one. And this happened in my home, but I was like five. I do not remember it. But we had a dog named Missy, uh, Boxer, and uh, Boxer goes down in the garage. Um, I apparently was home. My dad tells me this, but I don't remember it. Uh, Drinks, you know, you keep your 
what's got lawnmower and then dr- in gasoline. Gasoline spilled over, dog drinks the fucking gasoline. Oh. The entire fucking right. Mm. Dog goes ape shit, runs around the neighborhood like he's fucking on cocaine or something, comes back to the garage and runs round and round and round and round and round and drops over dead. Oh no. Because he ran out of gas. I have no <laughs> I have no legends. I have no legends, but it was a fun topic. Thank you for indulging my stupid. I hate that I bit onto that too. I'm like, damn, that's crazy. Why did I see that? I don't know. That was fantastic. Yeah. Sorry. Well, Jeffy, let's stick with you to wrap things up with the final topic here. Yeah. Listen, joking aside, you know, uh, and I know there's a guy who watches this stream and watches my stream, a guy named Mr. K, uh, and he, he just thinks I'm out of my fucking mind, but I've been paying a lot of attention to uh the hearings that have been happening around uaps and uh you know there was the stuff in the summer the david grush stuff everybody talked about there's you know whatever but last friday the uh the the oversight committee who you know and it's made it's bipartisan they've got you know some of the the hit list of like you know even like uh uh, who, who's the, the, the weird guy who looks like he's from, uh, lazy town, Matt Gates. Or, oh, Matt Gates. Yeah. Right. He's in there. And then you've also got AOC was on the panel. I mean, you've got, mm-hmm. you know, and they, they're all bipartisan. So it's, it's, it's a rare thing to see to begin with. Um, and they're, you know, investigating. It's like, look, we're giving the government millions of taxpayer dollars. We don't know where it's going because we keep getting hit with, oh, that's classified and it's related to UAPs and UFOs and whatever. So finally, they were able to get a classified meeting uh, last Friday. And uh, obviously, we're not privy to what they talked about or what they learned, but it was like, okay, we're at least going to start to, you know, get some information. And it came out that they, they all, you know, you can see this on the internet where they come out and they talk to reporters and most of them were like, well, they were still stonewalling. It's still all this information is siloed. So only certain people know certain things and it's designed that way. But we did get a little bit of information. Um, the, and then they shared the, the, the head of the committee said this. He said, um, what you can take away, though, is that um, people leaving that meeting uh, now believe that David Grush uh, is legit. Okay, and if you don't know David Grush, he was the whistleblower from July. He's the one that said, uh, uh, we've been working since World War II. We worked with the Vatican to get a ship that had crashed in Italy. Uh, The whole Roswell stuff, even though it wasn't Roswell, but, you know, all of that reverse engineering of technology. uh, He called them non-human biologics, which, what is it, a fish? I mean, there's a lot of non-human biologics, but, you know, but he was implying that it wasn't, it was some kind of intelligent creature capable of maneuvering this stuff, but it wasn't human. Okay, fine. Uh, And so first off, you've got this guy, not a fringe guy, not some weird documentary on Netflix. This is a elected Republican from the South. He's not out there, you know, doing fantasy shit, um, saying people left that meeting going that, that guy's claims are legit. Um, you know, they, he said like out of 10 claims he made, we looked into eight in that meeting and he's legit. That's first off staggering. He's not saying everything he said was correct, but then what followed was another woman uh, or a woman on the same board or, or oversight committee comes out and talks to the press. And she says, um, somebody asked him about extraterrestrials. And she says, it's important you understand that Grush never used the term extraterrestrial. He never said alien. What he said was interdimensional. And he, and she said, that's important, you know, and you can see this, this was on the news, or at least if you go on the internet. Yeah. And the woman, uh, by the way, the woman who said that is, is Congressman woman L- Luna. And again, to right. kind of underline why that's important is she's like mega MAGA. So you have like people oh, that, that would right? traditionally be conservative, evangelical, almost style right. Republicans talking about this. Anyway, go ahead. Oh, wow. <laughs> Across the board and, and yeah. Democrats that are not anything. You right, know? right. And, and, and so for me, A, that's cool and interesting. What does that mean? I'm curious about that. I'm fascinated by that. But as important, I'm fascinated that this is not headline news all over the goddamn world. Um, when you've got elected officials coming out and saying the guy who said there are interdimensional beings um, and it relates to what we're investigating in uh, 
uh, Congress and in these classified hearings, he is a legit person who said it. He's not some fringe quackpot, crackpot or quackpot. Um, and people are like, Meh, let's not cover that. I mean, I know there's a lot of things that affect our day to day that they're going to cover, but you would think that interdimensional beings might get people going, huh? What? And I'm curious why it's not. And I started thinking about it. You know, I'm an atheist agnostic. And so maybe since most people are religious, uh, it, it, you know, as much as I'm an atheist agnostic, I still go, yeah, I want to know what's going on. And maybe if you're a religious person or super spiritual or quasi religious, you're like, Jaffe, the only reason it fascinates people like you so much is because we already have that box checked. We, we believe in some sense that this, we know what's going on. God made all this. We die, we go to heaven, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and maybe that's why for me, I just can't get why the world isn't losing their shit over this. Because to me, this is the fact, the fact that you've got these people saying interdimensional, even if there are no creatures, even if we as a government or we as a species have figured out how to uh, uh, mathematically prove out multiple dimensions beyond, you know, 2D and 3D. In physics, say there are at least 10. And we figured out a way to utilize that for some kind of transportation to allow us, you know, one of the things that Grush said, or it was Grush, uh, was that there, they had a, a ship they had that was the size of a van, or he was told by this to from a military guy. But when you stepped inside, it was like Doctor Who's TARDIS. You stepped inside, it was the size of a football stadium. And it's kind of like, that makes all the sense in the world if you have figured out interdimensional space, because it's not really there, there. It's a couple of, you know what I'm saying? At the, you know, it's a different dimension, space, time, all that shit. Oh my God. So my brain is being blown and... uh yeah, that's all I know. I'm just I, I'm I'm as curious about what you guys think about what they said, and am I overreacting? And I'm as curious that if I'm not overreacting or even overreacting a little bit, why is this not the only thing people are talking about every goddamn day, twenty four hours a day? Yeah, I'm I'm really into this stuff too. So I'm gonna actually go last so I don't steer the conversation too much, Maddie. I want to go to you. Are you paying attention to any of this at all? Yeah, yeah uh, I will say. I was listening to a really fascinating podcast where the guy was reflecting on what Jaffe was noting, which was when people ask you about it or talk about it, it's like they seem to not actually know anything. It's like, aren't you curious to, to know more? So, yeah, talk to me about your your thoughts on this. I think it's funny because what Jaffe said resonates with me in a sense that I didn't really react. And now you say that I'm like in the moment, OK, why didn't I react? And I think it's. If I were to just throw out a guess for myself, it's like, oh, I see weird shit every day now. It used to it used to be weird to see weird stuff. You'd be like, oh, that was off putting. That made me uncomfortable. I made me feel some type of way. But I just feel like nowadays I hear and say, I'm like, of course, there'd be interdimensional beings. Of course, there's aliens. Of course, there's some other life out there. I'm like, yeah, of course, it would make sense. Just there's so much other weird shit I see almost every day. And it kind of curls back into what we were talking about with the Internet and like, that like, you know, there's that lack of analog, that sense of discovery. It's like, yeah, you're just going to eventually know everything or have heard of something one time by the end of your life. And uh, so I guess when I heard that, I was like, not that it wasn't a big deal. It was more like, yeah, like not a shoulder shrug, but yeah, that makes sense that this would be a thing. Hearing about it a little bit more in detail. It's also because like at times in all transparency, I get hesitant to dive deep into the the weeds of anything that is in the political spectrum strictly because I feel like our coverage of certain information is so biased that I'm never mm -hmm. getting like what actually happened. I'm getting like the spin on what happened from a particular side of the spectrum. So sometimes I almost remain ignorant deliberately. Um, but hearing it from you, Jaffe, um, it's interesting the change in terminology, right? Because we heard UFO for so long. So UAPs, I mean, that's, I guess that could be anything. And the question is, what is that? And I, and it is surprising that there would be less conversation on that because it truly can be anything. So I don't want to go on too long just because in, in all truth, I don't think I would have much interesting things to say. But I think that's why I found myself kind of static with it is I almost feel numb to the weird shit that happens in our world because uh, we're so connected where you'll see like there's a war happening in the Middle East. But here I am in America, just like nothing's happening. It's like another day. And you just, that disassociation grows mm -hmm. with so many things you hear that are either traumatizing, scary, weird, mind boggling. And so I think that would explain the reaction 
for myself at least, and, and maybe some out there. What about you, Dave? Where are you on this? I know you and I have long shared our fast and we <laughs> yeah. love Ray Bradbury and all the weird fucking short stories and about abducted kids and going and seeing fire in the sky and traumatizing me as a child with that. And we've always been into this shit. The Philadelphia Experiment. Absolutely. We What's love going it. on so, with AI now? Right. Exactly. Yeah. You and I have always, this has always been our wheelhouse of creepiness and eeriness. And so I know you're, you're paying attention to this in some way. Yeah. Big please freak me out energy. But I got to be honest with you. I think, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was our pal, Chris Raygun, who said this pretty recently on Sacred Symbols, I guess. And I want, I'm here for, to, to echo this sentiment. I think I'm ready to not hear another word about this until you could, until the big reveal. Like produce the goddamn actual evidence already. You know, I just have no, like rip the sheet off, show me the little green men, show me the future tech, super badass spaceship, whatever it is. Like, and you know what? I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of my bad. Like I just feel like in this day and age where we don't have to wait for anything, we could just binge watch whatever mm, we want. It's an interesting point. Yeah. It's unbearable for me to even wait two more days for the next episode of true detective it's like we don't we don't live i can't even i can't take it just just show me the you know the whole just just come on already like please like i just feel like i just don't te- the teasing out or whatever's happening is just it's kind of hard to bear at this point and i think that being said i've been on the earth a pretty long time and there's always been some sentiment of this although it seems to be increasing I do think we're close. I feel like we're the closest we've ever been to actually finding out some pretty outrageous, mind-blowing shit. I do inherently suspect that we're on the precipice of that. And I, I hope we are. And here's my, my thing, guys. I have a dream around this whole thing, sort of rooting for this to happen because it's a very specific dream. I, you know, I don't, I'm not rooting for annihilation. That would be a stupid dream. So I hope it comes that we find out there's other life in this universe, right? Here's the way I would, I would script it. There's a lot of tension going on in the world right now, right? We've got Russia, Ukraine, we got Pakistan and Israel at each other's throats. Now we got, we got oh, shots so- being fired and barbs being exchanged between Iran and Pakistan. We got China pressing down on Taiwan. We got all kinds of shit going, right? We need a little world peace. I'm, I'm a little concerned. I watch a lot of Lex Friedman. I'm, I'm a little concerned for World War Three at this point, you know. And yeah, he says it's a not zero percent chance now, right? He says something like that. Like it's yeah, a two, it's he says like, it's like two percent or something. He thinks something like that. It's that pretty World War III horrifying. Will yeah. To think, I don't know if we're Cuba missile crisis close, but it seems like we're sort of slowly drifting into to you know uncalm waters with everything. And I just think, you know, I don't mean to, to be too Independence Day about this, but I just think unifying against a common enemy would be really good for the planet right now. You know, mm-hmm. put all the hostilities aside, got to protect the earth, you know. And here's the thing, though, that sort of coming together and that alliance has to either be a deterrent towards the would be alien threat or. It just has to be a misunderstanding. Like, oh no, we we're coming in peace. But by that point, we already agreed to put our differences aside, right? Now we got a new now we got a new friend. I don't mean to be too care bears about this, but it's my dream, guys. This is the way I this is the way I would script it. I view the world and the same. now we got now we got a new friend. Now everybody's getting along on the planet. Now we got a new friend as well. You know, so I think. I don't, th- you you know, like I know there's uh I know the religious repercussions would be bad. I, I mean, I'm Catholic. I don't feel like that. I feel like I want it. I feel like this would be pretty cool. I've never understood know? so, that argument. If you can still like, why can't God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost go around to different planets? Amen. I mean, well, you know, I, hear well, I, I'm well, I, I disagree with that. That interpretation of Genesis is totally. The interpretation of the beginning of Genesis is, is, a, is a, a universe centered on the earth. Yeah, yeah they can I mean, there's own. a lot. So, there's so lot it would just in, so what you're implying is that if this life exists, that it's not even as important as ours. That's why. That's why to me, I well, think that. But, it's, but I don't. It's, even, I don't. Your the the thesis doesn't work, does it? Because Genesis is a book 
written on Earth about the creation of Earth. But if you go to, let's just say there's life on Venus, they can have yeah. their own version where in the beginning there was nothing, meaning Venus didn't exist. Mm. And then God created all this gas and whatever Venus Well, I guess, I, but that's, yeah, but what you're, I appreciate what you're saying and understand that, but that's not the way many Christians interpret it. Oh, they're the center of the universe is human humanity. Yeah, I mean that's. I mean, I, 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 I personally feel like that would be innate. I know people argue around that, and obviously religions always have to adapt. I mean, look yeah. at the way the Catholic Church has come around on yeah, gay, you know, gay people in some sense. Yeah, so you've not really abortion, but gay people and trans stuff and all of the rest. And I don't sure. think that they should have to bend. I mean, that's what a religion is. It's fine, and you can do whatever you want. Um, so I'm not saying that they can't change in the future, but I think that that's something major that will have to be dealt with. Yes. Mm. Yeah. No, the cafeteria like, Catholics have it right. We we just wanted all the cool stuff. <laughs> we just switched from more scripting it like an entertaining TV show. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Um, but I, I yeah, if I may, to the uh, to the alien and the independence and all that, y- yeah, maybe whatever. I mean, it's not. It is a good dream. But for me, though, the reason maybe this is so much more interesting. And, and we're thinking and talking and obsessing about is that we're not talking something so sci-fi, you know, we're not, we're not having to sort of go that far for this to be true. Like, oh, they're alien. You know, when they come out and say, well, for many, many years, I don't know how many physicists have speculated and mathematically proven, although what does that really mean? Uh, I mean, I know what it means, but we can't, we don't have tangible evidence of multiple dimensions. Um, when they come out and say, oh, the guy's legit and we're not talking aliens, we're talking interdimension, that alone, because that, that the, the ramifications of uh, other things sharing the same space with us, mm. uh, whether it's organisms or just rocks, and we simply can't feel it or see it, and we may now have the ability if nothing else, to be aware of it and maybe at the highest to utilize it for transportation and moving and exploring, mm-hmm. that's that's not Independence Day. That's just like, holy shit, yeah. did, 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 do we have evidence of that theory being real? What does that mean to have 10 dimensions, six dimensions? I mean, you guys all know the flatland bullshit, right? The whole, uh, sure. you know, you can't see. That's what we're talking about. Who knows what we're not able to perceive because we only can live in three dimensions. I, I That's the stuff that keeps me super jazzed. The thing I'm really interested in with, I mean, there's a lot I'm interested in talking about with this, but to add to the conversation, I'll say that I think that there's this theory, and Dagan has expressed this in the past, and a lot of people have, that when this started to get talked about, the assumption was, beginning really in 2018, with like that there was like a Wall Street Journal article that was kind it's of like, technique. oh, the Pentagon's doing some shit that's weird. And and then people started like um, Captain, uh, what's what's the, the the pilot's name, ended up on Rogan. Oh, 60 Minutes. Yeah. Oh, and 60 Minutes as well. But, but it was but all- there was the New York Times cover of oh, the TikTok video. Yeah. Uh, the, the right, Pentagon exactly. Released. And so people were like, why are you doing this? And like that it's distracting from something else. But I think that the very reality that no one seems to really care indicates that if it's an op, it's failing. And yeah, I've and never really it. believed that it's an op. I think that now what they realize, probably beginning with that, with FOIA requests and with the inability, maybe the circle of people, even with their deep compartmentalization, is starting to grow where they're like, this is going to come out and we can control it. And I think that that's where we are right now is like they know that we're going to figure out what this is and i know it's crazy but so, there is something fundamental that we don't understand about being we're being visited by something i and dagan and i have talked about this ad nauseum and it's come up on the show before that like the working theory that they're humans actually from other times or dimensions mm-hmm. is entirely possible which is why maybe they're also loath to use the term alien and it all ties together. See, and and Jaffe, I've I've lamented this to you before many times. Is like, and from my perspective, the mainstream media has gotten so much wrong and lies about so much that I don't give a fuck what they have to say about this. The problem is that it's difficult to know where to go underneath the surface to get yep. reputable detail, and that's why you really have to go to direct sources. The thing about David Grush that's frustrating is he's not a witness. Right. 
Like he has never mm-hmm. seen, dealt with, manipulated any of the stuff that's been claimed. He's spoken to people who have. And yeah, right. And apparently and, in that meeting, he finally gave names because it was classified. Right. And they and won't give they, those names, which they did the they last time. Yep. And it and then the government and all these things got to those people before they were able to subpoena them and all that. So that's why they're that's keeping right. the name secret this time. I think that I, I know the exact exit interviews you're talking about from the congressional like skiff or whatever, mm-hmm. where they were looking mm-hmm. at things and talking to him. And I thought that there were what I would consider these are politicians. Some mm-hmm. sees more seasoned than other, but they know what they're doing. And I think that they were all giving us little pieces of information in some way. One of them said you were saying about Roswell before one of them brought up Roswell. I thought that was interesting because he's like and he said something like, let's say what happened in Roswell was real, something like that. And I was like, right, right. Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah, now I think it's from my perspective, I think it's fairly clear that something happened in Roswell in 1947. There are fucking newspaper articles, local newspaper articles about it. People were just like things were just removed and stories changed and people got to it really quick. And actually, it's some of the most brilliant American propaganda ever because they started using it at that point to turn on people and be like, these motherfuckers are crazy. What are you kidding? They're fucking crazy. What do you? Oh, we have uh, aluminum foil stuff that just unfolds itself. No, we don't. Well, what if we find out that like that stuff was true? Like, where do you even get that from? You know, right. It's the same thing about the that jellyfish alien video mm-hmm. that's going around, that, which is yeah. interesting where I don't really know what to make of it. Some people say it's balloons and well, like no, other okay, things. Cor- but first, before, before I, I, yeah. educate me, yeah. because my when I first saw the jellyfish thing, yeah, I was like. Yeah, it's I don't know what it is, but it's just some balloons or something. But then somebody's saying, yeah, but you can only see it at a certain frequency. So if you're watching it through not infrared, but you can't see that with the naked eye. Yeah, like it goes around like it's unclear what this altitude is, as I understand it. So like yeah. it could be higher than you think. But like the the compelling part of the video is that no one seems to know they're there. So like, right. Like, so it's and not, then the m- Pentagon yeah. came out yesterday. Did you see that? No, I don't think I did. The Pentagon, unlike the Tic Tac video, which they said, okay, well, we'll let this out. They released a statement yesterday and said uh, it was pretty much calling all their people out and saying, uh, we take leaks very seriously. You know, we, you know, in other words, this was not supposed to come out and we're fucking pissed that this came out. Oh, wow. That was direct from the Pentagon spokesperson yesterday. Interesting, because so, you know that yeah. it's the one thing I do know about it, or apparently like what they say is that it's a clip, that there's a longer right. version of it where it goes into the water, apparently. Yeah. Oh, shit. Um, and that, that hasn't been released yet. But there's so much to say about this because I think what's going to end up happening, in my opinion, I don't know if it's like they're from another planet or it's interdimensional. I think there's a lot. I mean, it's almost a Graham Hancockian, and I really like Graham Hancock a lot. I think he's really interesting. And I actually think he's been proven being proven more and more right. Like he was so successfully marginalized after fingerprints of the gods and stuff that I remember being in college and everyone's like, oh, that dude's a fucking hack. You know, like that guy's nothing. The Netflix guy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because he's been floating around really with the stuff since the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And like, I mean, I've, I've seen some compelling debunkery of that guy, but that said, continue. I have to. I've Sorry. watched all yeah. of that stuff, like the, the guys going beat by beat. I, I yeah. think he's on to something with the very idea that we know so little about human history that it's possible that there was a technological race or is oh, or was no, sure. or could be or whatever in the timeline. Sure. That's visiting us. And or that's almost a, more likely and just a different dimension. They're right. Exactly. Right now, and that's almost right here. And that's almost that's like stranger, but more likely than the alien visitation yeah. stuff, because you can't. I mean, this goes all into different modes of thinking and things I've read about. But like, you can't think like an alien. Right. But you would think that why would they even bother if you could come here and because people are like oh they're going to come here and attack it's like well, why if they can interdiment or in, in intergalactic or interstellarly travel between star systems they have such they don't need anything from us they don't need our water right. or Zero. our fucking platinum are you kidding mm, you right. know they probably have well, fucking dyson spheres around us. stars I buy, I buy that wait what'd you say they might want to, I, the theory that they might come to observe kind of like Star Trek. Yeah, like, like the that the zoo theory or whatever, enter, the zoo yeah. hypothesis. You're right. But you're right about the other stuff. Why yeah, like it they... just, you can't, I don't want to rationalize like a human for an alien, but it just seems, it seems unlikely. Yeah. And so it seems like what we've, 
the fascinating thing since Roswell and going all the way into fire in the sky and all the random shit that you kind of look at and be like, okay, maybe, maybe. And the Skinwalker Ranch stuff and all the weird shit that's going on in the CIA trying to hide everything. And what I find, what we're going to find, I think, is that something that we thought was science fiction was true and that this stuff has been being laundered in some way through fiction for a long time. And that like there's some vertical storytelling apparatus in sci-fi that will go back and be like, this is it. Yep. They call it you know, they call it soft disclosure, right? Right. They use they use that for that. Right. And mm. that goes back to Tom Clancy and others where they would like they um our our stepdad, who's a CIA and or an FBI FBI analyst, talks to talks to me about this sometimes where he's like, back in the day, and he was in the Navy as an intelligence intelligence officer, he was like, people would look at Tom Clancy novels and be like, How the fuck does he know that? Like like it would be written like fiction, but it's dead ass real. Yeah. Right. And so they realized that people were talking to him. And I think you'll find that when we go backwards with other things as well. But I think what they success and I think this is very compelling. And a lot of people, I think, agree with this, is that the reality is, is that though the Manhattan Project was compromised by the Soviets, when you think about the Americans that knew about it, it amounts to about fewer than 10 who knew really knew what they were doing, going all the way up to the president into the what the Pentagon and the War Department at the time and all of the rest, no one really knew. And I think that they've managed to hide this probably at weapons manufacturers and certainly they've named them. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's kind of the most fucked up part is that like the companies there, they know. And it's been suggested that their board members and CEOs of these companies might not even really be what they call read in. Yeah. That there are like these permanent skunk work kinds of things. And the creepiest thing to me when you hear some of these people talk about it is that they haven't figured out dick from these ships like there, there are rumors that like they can't even get into them that and then there are That's these rumors brutal. that like they like they do things that they don't understand like the, you guys read about the one where you walk into it and it, it's like an astral projection where it's like mega huge even though the ship on the ground is like really yeah. small when you go inside That's it's insane. like the size of a football field that's insanity and like that the idea is that these things are kind of weight and i think this is very compelling and david grush i think is getting to this which is you can't compartmentalize to this degree because the people that know the answers will never know the problem. Eventually you have to like, let everyone know you're dealing with this. You guys are simply not no offense, smart enough. And maybe none of us are, but you have to kind of crowdsource this at this point. We've been sitting on some of this stuff since the thirties. Apparently probably before. Did you see what he said in a much older interview about religion where he said he saw this document, um, and it said that the, 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 it's a huge thick document on religion that's super top secret classified. And he said that we are containers is what we're called in the document. And the reporter says, what do you, containers for what? He says, I don't know. You know, you can call it the soul. Maybe it's just, uh, uh, you know, the meat inside of us. I, he, he had no clue. He said, but he says all religion exists according to this document because it's, the way it's the most successful way it has been thought of to keep us from harming each other. So we don't hurt what we're supposed to be containing. This is Grush saying this like wow. eight years ago to a reporter. So it could be, maybe the government knows and it's like, look, this is why we get all these religions tax exemptions and all this shit. Cause we need them because if this shit falls apart, we've been keeping this thing going for, you know, millennia i don't i mean i'm I, i'm not a i'm not a tinfoil hat guy i don't know what if anything's going on but i'm just something's going on and i'm staggered that that it's not the only thing people talk about when same. they wake up and go yeah. oh. no it's all, i'm totally the same i and i it's funny because i'm not 100 percent convinced that it's going to happen i'm i think it's likely that there's something like very likely that there's something going on but i also can't escape some of the fallacies and everything like my biggest thing it goes into any conspiracy where like how can this not have come out unless you really just look at as i said such a thorough propaganda campaign against people what's that guy from the 80s day that we were fascinated with for a little while that was saying all that weird shit that worked at los alamos bob lazar bob Bob lazar Lazar, right and like people like that would come out and they'd be like oh fuck this shit yeah. Like we're shutting this dude down, you know, and they really effectively move against him 
yeah, in ways over and crazy. over again where it's like, oh, you yeah. don't think about this at all. To the point where like if these things are fucking gray aliens, like the gray aliens we know about, I'm going to be like, you motherfuckers, like from the very beginning. Yep. They were right about this, like the actual way they look like that's that to me is going to be if they are some sort of extra dimensional terrestrial whatever being and they look like that big I'm gonna, be like, I'm gonna be like i can't fucking believe this that's how you know, i say they Asimov lied to us and... so thoroughly they better not right they better why be humans in fucking spaces why would they lie then because forget the religious thing I, again that's just a fringe grush i don't know if that's true or not but short of that if the government knows why would they not let the world know i mean what, what are they hiding i think the most compelling argument to that is just the the real the reality that a government so you the american government speaks from a position of power Mm -hmm. right and then it's going to tell you that there's something that it cannot control or contain working within its airspace around it it's like it's just a weird thing to admit i think they're being i think and i think that's maybe the answer as to why other governments because it's not like they're coming to the united states only i do think there wasn't i do and i've I feel smart, but it's like a broken clock right twice a day sort of thing where when I was a kid and studying Roswell and like reading about it and I'm like, why would they go there at that time? And I'm like, they were attracted to the nuclear bombs, you know? And like yeah. to the nuclear pro, the, the nuclear bomb, well, like the, the Trinity pro- story is a little off though. It wasn't really Roswell where the thing crashed there. It was delivered to Roswell. There's a whole thing about a pilot and it was actually over Washington state. Um, You're talking about the the Roswell crash happened in Washington and they moved it. Uh, you keep talking. I'll, I have it right here. I'll no, I, I I believe you. I was just no, saying. I, I felt I'm just curious. I felt smart just in the sense that um, this seems to be a common thing that comes up that they are somehow intrigued by nuclear power or like yeah. attracted to it, and a, a, as if it's a signal of they these people are in some way in some like they're at the yeah. very beginning of what we would call Einsteinian or Newtonian physics, where like we're starting to solve the puzzle and that's the sign that they engage with us or start to look. Or, or it could be that if they are multidimensional, that somehow radiation will get to them. And it's like, look, we don't give a fuck what happens to you, but if you blow up these bombs, that radiation is going to hit us over here. That's fascinating. And, that yeah, is, I love that. Um, that really is. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so I just, I look at all of it and I'm like, I do see how you could be skeptical. But sure. I think we're going to get to a point where there will be no more skepticism. Yeah. And I think that you hide it because you can't. Con- I think you hide whatever you can't explain. The, I mean, if these people, if th- these people, if these th- these things are moving around, staying perfectly still in air, moving at speeds we can't possibly imagine going in and out of the water, in and out of space. These things are being tracked by all these radars. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> you don't want to admit that or you don't want to talk about that. You no. don't want to be like have the conversation and be like, yeah, we have control of like what we know about. but. These motherfuckers are just doing whatever they do. And they enter. It goes all the way back to the Foo Fighters in yeah. World War II. LA. Those were probably real. I mean, that's the craziest part about like just the revisionism that's going to be necessary once we have the specific answers about, oh, so this, 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 and this actually did happen. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Trace it back. Yeah. yeah. But it is, you're right, though, Kyle. It is. It's a, this is a first for humanity to sort of embody this idea or, you know, it sort of entertain this idea of like, there are things that are out of our control that could potentially, that are mysterious. Let's just put it that way. Well, there are things, there are sentient things that are out of our control. Like we understand that a comet could hurdle at the earth sure. and we'd probably not really be able to do anything about it right now. Or right. maybe we would be able, maybe there's probably some secret shit that they would try to do to knock it off or whatever. But it's like, that's kind of just like the ping pong table of, of, uh, of asteroids and comets and planets and all of that. But this, this idea that, that we are amongst a super, it's like, that is almost the idea of what like a supernaturalism. You can almost understand again, rewinding all the way back to antiquity. Sure. What people might've been interacting with. And it's almost like the idea of gods and all these things. It almost doesn't sound as silly as it does. If you think that these people were being interacted with in this way, it's like, that's actually, you're like a fucking caveman banging rocks together and you see some crazy shit like that. Of course you're going to think it's maybe, maybe it wasn't an asteroid. Maybe it was actually a spaceship or some sort of, I don't know. I think it's crazy in a while that I think does put you in that headspace where, you know, a lot of we've had so long with religion and science and people have been able to peel off of the literal interpretation of a lot of these texts. But now we're in a thing where 
if any of this is true and we're facing something just so impossible to think about based on our day to day that we may be creating all kinds of fantasies about what it really is, but it is something. And it may be another 3000 years before we know what it is, but at least we're getting to the point going, okay, something's going on now. And it's not just fringe bullshit. Um, the Roswell thing, by the way, I've recommended mm. this book before. I'm not pitching the book. I wish I was, I'd totally take money to pitch this book. Uh, but there's a whole chapter on Roswell in here and how there's a lot of misinformation about it and where the actual thing went down. And, mm. but it's, 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 I mean, it's still Roswell was could a key have, place where a lot of this shit happened. Could it have crashed in Washington and then interdimensionally split it off, have, off into, yeah. yeah. And ended Absolutely. up in the Southwest. That's what I think happened. I'm going to call this guy. Um, <laughs> Collins figured it out, motherfucker. Dude, I just think it's it's awesome to think that we don't really understand anything. Like, we no. really don't. It's so no. fun in some way, but it's very yeah. scary. But is it really scary? We have it's these finite scary. lives. It's like, it's it's enlightening. Like, we might be living at a time where we discover something fundamental about yeah. not being alone. And I think that that's going to be a tough thing for people to deal with. In the only lots of scary, ways. well, or the only scary thing is if the government knows something like we are containers for the brain and we're here just to fill the brain with data. And when we die, our brains continue because these interdimensional beings use them, but we're done. We're just like cows being way that'd be so amazing people. that's incredible. it would be but i could see people learning that and going yeah. uh fuck everything what mm -hmm. the fuck am i gonna do now you know so totally maybe they breathe believe it'll be such a psychotic break for most people that they just won't be able to handle it maybe that's true i don't fucking know it's like, every time dude. we talk about this it's such amazing fodder for insane fiction Definitely. We should I just get it all out on the page now before we find out the actual thing. Totally. I agree. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing as you were saying that, like you have a story idea there. In my There's opinion. so many. But I'd still rather watch the series about the people who put hot dogs up their vagina. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could somehow mesh the Mix two them. things. Yeah. Because the hot dog was too big to go up there. It's Imagine. the size of a football field in the vagina. <laughs> That's how babies get made. You can't make a baby in a uterus. It's too small. But... You, you have, imagine there. the interdimensional being like next to you, but in his own space, and you're putting the hot dog in your vagina, and he's just watching. <laughs> oh, there's a whole we're a whole TV series for people. We're Netflix for the interdimension. They're like, dude, you got to see this fucking idiot. He literally likes to put mice up his butthole, and he likes. I mean, yeah. And maybe they're freaking out because they're starting to they're starting to like not be able to hide it successfully anymore. You know, right? And and, it's like having their shows canceled. It's like yeah. fuck. Once Colin realizes we're watching him. Yeah, very Truman Fuck Show like. It. Yeah, once they yeah. once we started seeing them. Yeah. Anyway, well, if you guys are here, you fucking idiot, stop hiding. We're right here. We're not going to hurt you. Well, it would be might, good to see them. Probably won't. Yeah. It would be good to hang out with them. Well, that was fun. Are we all satisfied Indeed. with our topics? Very good. Indeed, gentle folk. Well, let's say goodbye to everyone. Go around the horn, Maddie. Thanks for taking the time to speak to with us today on this. Uh, for us, it's Friday afternoon. Of course, I can't tell if you're being sarcastic right now because I didn't talk much. This oh, no, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm I was not. a humble listener during that stretch. I thought you were just like, <laughs> no, I was I, like, yeah, you're right. Dude, it's so uh, funny you say that you might not have. Well, I don't know who listens to Sacred and doesn't, but we brought this up at the beginning of Sacred that I because I complimented Chris about something. And then I'm like, I mean that, by the way, because I was like, every compliment in modernity sounds passive aggressive. Like you, it's no, hard I'm to compliment usually not receptive like, but that way. Yeah. I was just acknowledging. I was like, I know I was pretty quiet during that section. <laughs> no, it's all good. I don't mind at all. What's modernity? Uh, no, it was great to be here. That was a lot of fun. What do you? Um, what'd you say? I'm sorry. Hold on. What does modernity mean? Like in in the era of being modern, like right now, modernity. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Good. Didn't sorry, that word. No, I was just saying. Good time to be here. Had a lot of fun. A lot of good conversation. I agree with Dagan though. I walk away with like great fictional ideas mm. every time I'm on Constellation. It's totally <laughs> crazy as shit. So we just go everywhere with it. So the brain's just going mile a minute, but it's a, it's a great time. Jaffe, thanks for taking the time to join us. We appreciate you. Good God, man. I love this show. I love coming on this show. I'll be here as long as you'll have me. It's always fun. It's always interesting. Um, yeah, man, I dig it. I dig it a lot. Thank you for having me. No, you're very welcome. And yeah, we'll have you back very soon. And Dagan, of course, goodbye to you, my friend. Have a good rest of your day. That was so fun. Thank you. Love this group. Love doing the show. Thanks for having me. But thinking about how can we tie the UFA thing or UAF, sorry, with the, with the hot dogs and then involve Florida.
somehow. Yeah. Gotta t- gotta, so we're going to come back to Florida. Feed it into an AI or, engine and it'll come it's up. It's like with rainy with a chance of meatballs. So what happens is the interdimensional portals open up, all the hot dogs fall down, impregnate all the women, <laughs> right? <laughs> And that is how interdimensional beings can be born in the third dimension. Boom. I, it's, it's a gift, like I said. It really is. It's a gift. <laughs> all right, my friends. Appreciate you. Appreciate all of you out there. Thank you again. Uh, Patreon.com last, uh, slash Last Day Media for early ad free access. Last Day Media store for merch. Uh, live show coming up soon, which we're excited about. More information on that on Patreon. You're doing it with the Iron Lords, right? I yeah. saw that today. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, so That's we're going to have them out, awesome. which is cool. And yeah, Maddie's the only one that can't make it, right? Matt, you're not making it because you're at I PAX, right? I was going to be at PAX, yeah. yeah. So we're going to do another show hopefully later. We're, we're aiming for San Diego, so we'll be yeah, in touch that about that. That was my show. understanding, oh. so. Yes. And then uh, hopefully a European one at the end of the year, but we'll see how that all goes. It's very expensive and hard to get it all together, but we're working on it. So um, appreciate all of you guys out there. Thanks again, guys, for joining me today. Thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support. See you next time. Until then, goodbye. Constellation is a product of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is my brother, Dagan Moriarty. The show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman, and is edited by associate producer, Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 